All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Talking Landscape Photography um, and number 62, I believe it is. And uh, we are really, really stoked tonight to have a very dear friend of mine join us, uh, Jay Evans. And Jay is uh, somewhat of a, um, I guess you could say expert on Uluru, or maybe experts, uh, it's always a tough word to use, but um, he's certainly spent a lot of time studying Uluru and, um, and the cultural uh, background to Uluru uh, as part of um, his tour guide training as well. So um, we're very interested to hear what he has to say tonight, and um, I'm sure it'll be very informative and educational for all concerned as well. Um, Jay, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks, Luke. Yourself? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. It's um, been, been very interesting times lately. Um, how's things been going for you over in um, Sydney in the Blue Mountains? Oh, you know, like I think anybody else who's in New South Wales right now would be in a similar position, which is um, we've been pretty much locked down now for I think week 14. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's been, a, it's been an interesting uh, uh, three months, three and a bit months we're well, coming up to. Uh, so we're, uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, the, the magic date at the moment of the 18th of October, which when we can all get out of um, uh, uh, get, get out of it and actually get back to uh, back to some normality, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Yeah, well, is, is that pretty um, ironclad that date or is it um, uh, based thought, on vaccinations, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be dependent on the magic vaccination figure as to whether that happens or not. And obviously, given what's happening uh, in places such as Melbourne today and for the past few days as well, um, which, you know, don't want to go too far into that. But obviously, mm. yeah, there's, there's uh, you know, a lot of social unrest yet to come and everything else as to, you know, what's going to happen around getting those figures. So, hey, who knows? Things may happen earlier. Things may happen later. We just don't know. There's no there's no guarantees on it right now. So, uh, but, uh, but I mean, I have to say, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. I live in, you know, one of the most beautiful areas in the world in the Blue Mountains, skirts by the Blue Mountains National Park. That's in my local government area, so I'm allowed to go and exercise around there as much as I like, um, which is pretty much what I've been doing. So, um, yeah, it's great to be able to, uh, to, to get out and enjoy, uh, enjoy the valley views um, and enjoy the walking tracks um, around here as well. Um, uh, most people who are in the city are not as fortunate, unfortunately. But, um, mm. yeah, look, we will get out of it. We will get out of it sometime very, very soon and uh, be able to get on. Uh, mm. uh, get back to some normality again yeah absolutely absolutely um yeah always thinking of um everyone else that um is going through that so it's a bit of a weird situation to be um in a place where there's um relatively uh, no restrictions at all so um yeah so that's yes so certainly um interesting times and um well, um, tell us about your um, relationship with, I guess, Uluru as a place and, and what it means to you um, and, and how that all, you know, you, you first came across it, I suppose. Yeah, well, probably you probably should start off as well um, just by acknowledging Ananu. Um, mm, true. They're the traditional custodians of, uh, of Uluru, Katajisa, um and the National Park. Um and uh, I've got to give our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be present with us today. Mm. Uh, very important for us to acknowledge that, um, especially uh, given the cultural significance of, uh, of Uluru, um, which uh, some people are well aware of um, having visited and some, some people have probably visited and photographed and taken uh, images of the scenery, but not really gone into the depths of sort of the cultural aspects um behind behind the LaRue as well so um so but so yeah my my affiliation with LaRue I mean I started out um I mean most people know me or have come across me in the past um I didn't grow up in Australia I didn't come here till I was 30 years old no so, <laughs> was, um so back in 2003 and um you know when I first arrived here um, I went out and did my thing from the UK and I bought a four-wheel drive and I said, I'm going to go and travel the country and I'm going to go and see everything I could. Um, and I ended up in Uluru um, uh, after a few months after arriving in Australia and uh, was just absolutely blown away. We drove up from, well, I drove across from Sydney to Adelaide, uh, stayed at our friends in Adelaide for a while, picked up some passengers from backpacker hostels, as you do. <laughs> and we travelled all the way up through the centre 
And the plan originally wasn't going to be to go to Uluru, it was going to be to travel straight up to Darwin, but somebody in the party said, no, I really must go to Uluru. And that's where we ended up. And uh, yeah, it turned out to be an amazing experience out there. And I've kind of been going back every couple of years ever since. And obviously since we started working together, Luke, mm. um, pretty much every year, except 2020, because mm. no one did anything. It's always the highlight of the year for sure as well to get out there. So yeah. Um, so, and I guess that's... um. You know that we have put a fair bit of work in to be able to to do that. You, you've put in a lot more than I have, I have to admit. But um, you know that. <laughs> but um, the experience is um, uh, just completely incredible. So, yeah. I mean, we probably could just quickly mention about what we do out there in terms of the astro workshops and that kind of thing, just to provide that level of context as well. Yeah, that's right. So, so uh, for everybody on board who doesn't know what we do, uh, myself and Luke, uh, we uh, run uh, what we call Astro Workshops or astroworkshops.com. Uh, every year we take uh, a bunch of eager travellers around to different locations around Australia, um, hosting, um, hosting them uh, on astrophotography workshops. We teach astrophotography, nightscaping, um, teach how to capture the Milky Way in the skies. Uh, and obviously, at Uluru, Uluru is this um, incredible place that was just naturally made for astrophotography. Um, whoever it was that built Uluru, you know, 500 million years ago, did it right because they actually slapped it in a spot where you get completely clear skies and have the Milky Way rising up right behind it. Mm. So we're very, very fortunate uh, to be able to go out there every year. Um, and we do have the permissions from uh, the National Park to operate commercially in the park once it closes. Um, and that's a, you know, so we're very blessed to have that level of permission uh, to be able to take people in and uh, capture the night skies in the national park in some places that uh, um, you never would normally be able to get to, including all the way out of places like Catajusa, mm. uh, which is a spectacular place to capture the night sky from. It's mm, mm. definitely a very um, special place to be able to get out to at night. Um, we were very lucky this year. Unfortunately, things were cancelled last year because of the pandemic, pretty much everywhere else in the country. We were very lucky this year. Uh, we kind of managed to couple a band together, some who might be online with us tonight. Um, and, uh, and actually got out there. I think we, we got back two weeks before Greater Sydney went back into lockdown again. Uh, or, and in actual fact, I think we actually lost someone due to the Melbourne lockdown that occurred um, just a couple of days before we were due to depart as well. So, uh, so yeah, we were still very lucky to be able to get out there this year um, and, and go and enjoy the National Park before everything went haywire again. So, uh, so hopefully looking forward to 2022 and we may get out there again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully that would be pretty awesome, but yeah, it's tumultuous times at the moment. So um, yeah, just have to, to, to sort of wait and see how things pan out um, as um, anyone that runs workshops or, or has tried to attend a workshop would know it's um, yeah, definitely not a, not a great time to be planning travel. <laughs> so, but it's a lovely time to be talking about it and lovely time to learn a bit about some of the places that we might want to visit. And so um, that's why we've, we've really created this whole series of um, talks with um, people to, to, you know, visit places virtually, I suppose, and get a bit of an understanding about what's, what's, um, what's out there and what we can do. And um, yeah, so um, maybe uh, what we can do, Jay, is um, look at a map, perhaps. I don't know if you've got one prepared. I can also bring one up if necessary. I actually, I actually do have a map. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it's always good to um, sort of understand the lay of the land and, um, and how it all works before you go through the pictures. Because then, well, at least for me, I always like to have a, a mental picture of where um, the pictures were taken. So um, with all of it's reasonably... Um, there's only kind of a select number of places that you probably can photograph from actually in the park. So it's, it's relatively straightforward. And, and we will go also over uh, the photographic restrictions around Uluru um, and, and what, what the ins and outs are around that, just so that um, you don't put a foot in it, I suppose, um, yeah. which is um, actually quite easy to do um, uh, and, unless you, you know, study what, what's, um, what's appropriate. And that's really just out of respect for the traditional owners who, um, who um, you know, it's their wishes for, for the, the Uluru to be photographed in, in that way and cut a Judah as well. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I, uh, shall I share my screen? Yep. Oh, yep. You should be able to do that. I think I have. I have the power. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure you share the right one. Um, not that one. My computer for some reason has switched screens around now. So screen one is now my second screen. The screens. I don't. Oh, know. it's always handy when it does that. I don't know why it does that. Um, okay. So here's a map. 
<laughs> everyone can see that. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, just a Google map. Um, here's Uluru, this little blob down in the middle here, um, blob of rock down here. And all the way out off to the left here is Karajita. Uh, I always like to, when I'm talking about Uluru, I always like to share everybody this as a Google map up front, just so it give you an idea of the difference in size between both formations. Mm. Um, Uluru is tiny in comparison to Katajusa, but they're both made in a very, they were both formed in a very, very different way. So, so it just gives you an idea there of, uh, oh, sorry, um, an idea there of, you know, where they are located between each other. Um, Katajusa is actually, uh, what is it, uh, 55 kilometers away from Uluru. That's so, yeah. so it's actually it's quite a distance uh, to drive between Uluru and Kanajita itself. Um, so, uh, but uh, but all of that surrounding area um, to the west of Kanajita, to the east of Uluru, and to the south of both is still part of Uluru Kanajita National Park. The area itself um, is uh, uh, covers a very vast um, uh, area of uh, of land um, uh, out, out in the, in the uh, centre of the territory there. So do you, I'm sure you're slightly aware. Good evening, by the way, Paul. Hey, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, we're a little bit late on the, on the run tonight. I uh, was chasing work very hard to catch a count. But um, do you know the um, the Dreamtime stories of the creation of Uluru? And uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's one one of the things. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll talk I'll talk about it in a little while anyway. But um, uh, the um, Ananu uh, as a people. Um, uh, they're the traditional owners uh, and custodians of Uluru. Uh, uh, Ananu don't like to refer to them as dreamtime stories because dreamtime to them is something that's fleeting, something which is dreamt. Whereas mm. the uh, Chukapa, which is the, the, the bona fide religion, um, uh, which is the whole basis of everything around Uluru and Katajuta, uh, Chukapa is actually based on the creation ancestors and um, uh, their interactions with the landscape. Uh, and so it's not seen as being a dream time. It's not seen as something that, that did occur. Um, so they don't like to refer to it as, as actual dream time. Okay. But well, generally we have um, as a guide and uh, I'm referred to as Parampa. So I am a white guide um, at Uluru. Uh, and as a Parampa guide, we're only given um, access to certain stories. So um, and we're given stories that are called Tichi. Uh, which is children. So we're told these stories at a, a child's level. Um, but many of the stories in association with the marks in the landscape or the Chukapa stories or the Chukaricha, uh, as they're known, uh, the marks in the landscape left by the creation ancestors, um, we don't get told those stories. We're not authorized to, to be told them or to, to know them. Um, as you know, in many Aboriginal cultures in Australia, that has to be passed down by ceremony um, from person to person to the right people. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to retain those cultures because they're not written cultures. Uh, they're, oral, they're oral cultures, they're passed down. Um, and so if a connection is lost between a family member and uh, that story is not passed on, it's lost for, forever. And we, 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 don't get to, we don't get to retain it or the culture doesn't get to retain it. So that's why it's very important for us in a way, in a nutshell, to, to, to respect uh, the culture around Uluru and how that's actually passed on. And that has a, an implication on what we can and can't photograph there. And we'll, we'll run through some of that this evening as well. So we'll talk about the sensitive sites and uh, areas around Uluru and the reasons that we can't photograph some spots of it. Maybe, um, do you want to point out where the, the sunset and sunrise viewing areas or? Yeah, so I'll just use the power of Google uh, for the moment. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so if we're looking at if we're looking at Larue here, uh, normally you can see Conlon Airfield up here. It's the uh, Edge Rock Airport um, right, right at the north end there. And as you're flying in, you always get an amazing view of Larue as you're flying in. Um, unfortunately, you're always facing on the side of Larue that you're not really supposed to photograph. Um, but the so you're landing at the airport, you arrive at the resort, and then you drive on into the park. Um, which is, you know, in terms of the distance, it's not really that far uh, to actually get to Uluru, probably about 35 minutes drive, but it shows you the remoteness that in that area there, all you've got is you've actually got an airport and you've got the resort itself. And then this big swath of red dirt um, uh, as you cross into the park boundary into Uluru Kalajuta itself. Uh, and there is literally, there is nothing. 
Uh, and if you've ever been to Uluru and you've driven through the park gates uh, on either side, if you left and right, there is there is literally nothing once you're inside the national park except Uluru on the one side. There's no parks infrastructure. There's just a road that runs through the middle. Um, we actually head a bit further into the park here. We can actually see the signs here. I'll just gratuitously use Google Maps for the moment. The sunset viewing area is normally one of the first places that people head off to. And it's just like a little pull-off area off on the side of the road. Uh, well, quite a long, it's about a kilometre uh, in length along the side of the road there that literally gives you that perfect sunset view. Now, you can see my mouse pointer there. That's pointing off to the east because you see at sunset, most people don't photograph all the route straight into the sun. Uh, at sunset, people are looking for the, uh, the colour change on the rock. Uh, as the sun setting behind you. Um, and that's that romantic change of where it goes from the, the bright orange and blue that it is during the day uh, to that deep orange and then deep red uh, as, the, as the sun uh, sets off behind you. It's quite remarkable how long that lasts too, isn't it? It really seems it, to go on for, for a lot longer than, you know, the twilight hours are, yeah. And, and that's right. And it's in, we, um, you know, we, we experience it every year when we go, we, Spend quite a lot of time at uh, a location called Kanji Gorge. I'll show you Kanji Gorge shortly, where you're right up close next to the rock at sunset. And it's incredible that as the sun comes down, that you are close to this incredibly bright, burning orange color uh, that reflects everywhere. It reflects on the trees, it reflects on the ground around you. Um, and you know, it's an incredibly warming light uh, to, to be studying uh, when it's actually reflecting off the rock as well. So quite an incredible place to be, uh, to, to be close up at the rock. And most people don't do that. They don't go close to the rock uh, for sunset. Um, they'll hang around further away and get the view of the entire rock. But I'd always recommend to, at least if you're there, to spend one evening um, at sunset and actually go to somewhere like Kenji Gorge or, um, or, or next to the Marla car park uh, where the old climb used to be um, and actually experience that colour change up, up close and personal with the rock itself. Mm. Is it pretty reliable, the, um, the, the sunset colours? I mean, I assume it is being in the outback. Just need to have clear skies. Mm. Uh, Which is uh, pretty abundant. Day, you, <laughs> going, if you have cloud behind you, it's going to affect how the colour looks. Uh, but generally, if you've got a clear sky and a clear view to the horizon, yeah. Um, it's going to be that same colour pretty much every uh, every day when the sun sets. And there'll be a slight variation because obviously the sun shift from north to south uh, as as we go to each equinox. Um, but uh, but generally, um, you know, I mean, this time of year, what are we? So the sun would be setting, kind of looking out from just a little further south than west, uh, and looking into the rock here. So you know, if we get up and close personally here. You've got it still says the Uluru Climb Spot, even though it's now closed, thankfully. You've got the Marla Car Park that's here. You've got the Marla Walk that runs all the way around the edge of the rock here and takes you into Kanji Gorge. And so that sunlight is still going to be getting into Kanji Gorge uh, and giving you those really beautiful, bright orange colours. Um, I think it's the image you guys used for the... Um, Photographic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Photograph for, 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 for this, Gorge, yeah. this chat tonight. Uh, and that's actually looking into Kanju Gorge there, the waterfall shoot coming down Kanju Gorge uh, with that sun, that sunset directly on it, uh, that bright, bright orange colour that's there. Nick, I also tend to find if you can see like the earth shadow and the belt of Venus um, behind the behind Uluru, then um, it's pretty likely that you'll get a very nice, um, you know, deep colour in the, uh, at yeah. sunset. So it's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, give you give you that idea. That's not that's not even a process shot. So, uh, mm. but that's how deep and orange the colours actually would go. And that would be um, quite after sunset, wouldn't it? That one. Uh, that one would be after sunset. I, yeah. just, I would have picked one before of the. Uh, oh, there we go. Just at sunset. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just you know how different that colour looks, and that's before it even goes to that darker red colour. Mm. One thing we haven't seen so much is some of more of like the purples and and some of the other more bluish colours that you tend to get in very um, uh, poor weather as well, which um, that's a, that's yeah. another another um, colour entirely that can happen out there. 
because we're normally fortunate enough to be there during the best astro time, which means we have to have clear skies to get to to get the stars. So we don't get. That's normally a that's normally a pretty good time for stable weather too, I guess, isn't it? Like if yeah. you wanted to go to the rock to see, um, you know, uh, more um, uh, rainfall on it, um, which is a dream of everyone. Um, you know, that's that's more. I think it's more January or February or something like that. It's it's a bit earlier in the year. That's a uh, yeah, fe- fe- February March time yeah. would be would be the time to go for if you're really looking to try and get a wet season or get those kind of conditions. Mm. But it's still going to be disgustingly hot and humid. Yeah, uh, off off the back of off the back of summer, uh, and therefore that means lots of flies. So as uh, so you have to expect that um, yeah, those conditions will change. But again, just based on where the sun would 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 be. Um, and, and at, at that time, you'll probably see a significant difference in colour. I don't really have any images to show where um, those colours have been. I've been in, I think I was there in March a few years back, but uh, didn't really photograph much at sunrise or sunset while I was there. So mm. didn't really get to see those colours. But um, I'll give you an idea here. So this is actually just after that sunset uh, has occurred. And this is the kind of the, the deeper red colour. Uh, not a great image, uh, but you know that deeper red color uh, that the rock then becomes before we before we lose the light completely. Or before it's it probably got a bit more of a steely um, sort of uh, a tint on it too from the cloud cover as well. I'd yeah, imagine from the cloud yeah. Cover from above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what's the rock made of, guys? And what's its what's its kind of geological makeup and, and creation? It's such an unusual structure to be sitting. It's an sitting out there roughly, you know. Then the striation on the top was part of the was one of the things I was most intrigued by. Is that caused by water runoff on the top that eats into the rock? Yeah, water, water, and wind. So if we so if we think think about so um, I'm going to pull out. I'll I'll do the geological piece for this first. So give you guys yeah, an idea of how both are created. Uh, if we actually zoom right out on Google Maps, this is the other reason I use this. Right up to the north of us here, uh, we've got Lake Amadeus. So we've got the big salt pan lakes of Lake Amadeus right above us here. Now, back in you know, 500 million years ago, that was a mountain range that was pushed up, a geological uplift. It was the Alice Springs orogeny at the time. And as that pushed up and all of these rains started to occur, all of these alluvial flows came rushing off down off the top of the new mountain ranges. Now, those alluvial flows had, were comprised of two different things. There were big sands and silts, which formed a route. Uh, which you know, went into a basin that, that basically created the formation for Uluru. And then a huge conglomerate of rocks and mud and big boulders and stones that, that basically flowed off uh, that formed the basis for, uh, for Katajuta. And over time, sands blew in when the, the environment dried out, the desert became a desert, dried the whole thing out. And then again, through the uplift, what happened was that Uluru got turned up like a big stone plate um, 90 degrees. And so if you think that all those striations on the top there, that actually got turned up 90 degrees from where it was when it was buried under the ground. Uh, and that's a process that happened over, you know, 100 million years. And then gradually over time, wind and water has just eroded through uh, all of these very highly compressed um, sediments that were in there. So that's what the striations are, is actually layers of sediment that's... Been... Layers, layers of sediment, yeah. I mean, it's actually, it's it's compressed into rock. It's called arcos, um, uh, which is a, which is a mineral rock that's been, it's been compressed down from all those sediments over that time. But it's like a very, very, um, uh, a very solid sandstone. So the erosion has taken many millions of years to, to get to where it is today. And it's still eroding today. Wind will rush through and sand will rub up against it and, um, uh, and continue to erode it. And then the rain comes. And so we were just talking before we started off that, you know, I've got a bank account with money in it, waiting for the next major rain forecast at Uluru so I can jump straight on a plane and go out there and photograph the waterfalls running off the edge of Uluru. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, all of that just continues to take millions of years. The big difference with... Katajuta was that Katajuta made up of all these conglomerates, boulders surrounded by mud. Um, when that geological uplift happened that formed Uluru, it only turned Katajuta up 45 degrees. So if we think a plate that was under the ground and it got tilted up 45 degrees. And then, so that's why Katajuta has a natural uh. slope going all the way down and gradually because it was a uh, a mass of mud and boulders it's eroded through in you know much faster 
uh, and much deeper into the big curve assets that is created today, a place like Welba Gorge and at the back at Valley of the Winds. So very, very different formations, very different ways that they've, they've actually eroded away. Um, in fact, if you go out to Catajusi, you see if you walk through the walk through Welba Gorge here, you actually see looking up on the side, you can see huge uh, boulders on the ground made up of smaller boulders uh, mashed together with mud. And you can actually look up above and you can see where they actually popped out of the rock face uh, right up above you. You know, we're, we're talking 50, 60, 70 meters right above you and there's a hole in the rock where this big chunk has actually dropped out. And again, that process will continue to happen. It will continue to erode away, um, but just probably not that much in our lifetime. Um, so, but, uh, but that's, how, that's how they were both formed and that's what's happened. That's why they're very different shapes. Uh, and that's why they they look very different um, uh, in terms of their makeup. Uh, Uluru being a much more compressed, more solid rock uh, than Kanajita. And what makes the striations such a singular direction? Do you think they might have? Is it is it the is it the winds? Is such a consistent kind of direction, or it's just the it's the layering? It's the it's the layering of the sediments. So as those sediments have come down off the mountain and they've actually, they've basically, they've layered. So bear in mind, that's been lifted up 90 degrees. So you're looking at a cross section, basically. You're looking at a cross section, yeah. that's right. Uh, so, okay. so that's why it erodes in those striations and those lines, because they're the individual layers of sediment um, that, that, that made up the, the huge solid chunk of rock in the first place. Those sediments would have laid down over layers over, you know, 50 to 100 years, then another layer comes down and the layer comes down. And so it's gradually built up in layers like that. Um, yeah, just for a sense of scale, what's the circumference? Uh, seven and a half kilometers. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, so it's quite a, quite a distance around it. And again, it looks a lot smaller when you're looking at it from a Google map. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but quite a distance around. And then around the base of um, Katajuta is more like about 25 kilometers in total. So uh, it's a much bigger, uh, much bigger distance around it. So... Uh, and if you think as well, Uluru is uh, what's uh, 390 meters high um, from ground to summit. Um, so it's, it's got it's got a quite a, it's quite high as well. Um, I always think about it when I live up here in Katoom in the Blue Mountains. For me to walk into the Jamison Valley or all the way into the valley, I can walk down uh, 200 meters to be on the valley floor. Um, yet yeah, Uluru is actually 390, so uh, so it's actually it's it's, uh, it's quite a lot higher. Uh, quite a lot higher up. So that gives you an idea so of, of, how, of how, how everything was created. Um, the Arcos rock that Uluru is made up from is, is one of the reasons that has that amazing color change at sunset as well. Because Arcos is a um, it's feldspar, it's, a, it's an iron mineral. Uh, and that feldspar um, oxidizes. So when it hits the air, it becomes rust. Um, and so it's actually what you're seeing when you're seeing the orange glow in Uluru is actually is the rusty feldspar mineral uh, reflecting the orange and the red light back. It's uh, very, that's very similar to Belichick. what we have here on our east coast in Tassie, actually, with um, that Freysenae. You know, it's full of um, feldspar. So full, of, full of feldspar. So you get the, red, the reds on the rocks. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's the, that's the lichen as such. But if, if you look at the the, the hazards or um, or you know mountains like that, um, the granite there, it's um, it's comprised of a lot of um, pink feldspar. So yeah, yeah. So and then again, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it, this is this is the thing about Uluru and the, why the colour change is so um, mm. uh, it, it's so dramatic um, because it's just, it's filtering all that red light. Uh, and, and sending it back to us, and, and that's you know that's that's one of the most incredible things about the formation. But I mean, it's one of the reasons it's in um, as part of its dual world heritage listing uh, is that natural formation um, uh, as a monolith uh, is, is one of the reasons that it's uh, it, it's been world heritage listed for its natural values, uh, both that and Katajuta, just because it's a flat desert plain with these two monolithic um, formations um, joining out and just the way they were actually formed. Mm. And there's a few other spots we haven't sort of mentioned just briefly about Tien as well, where the sunrise viewing area is. Yeah, uh, so so some people will still go to the sunset viewing areas of view sunrise as well. Uh, we've got a few shots of there. Um, 
can actually yeah, go. Yeah, it's actually and, fantastic for sunrise there, yeah. And at the right time of year, it's a great time and a great time to be there because you get the sun mm. rising up off the side of the rock and you get sun stars. Yeah, you win. But again, <laughs> on the other side, we've got uh, TN. Or um, you're going to you're going to say, Luke? Have you been um, no, I haven't been practicing. Okay. Telling the Garu Nakanjaku. Telling Guru Nakanjaku. Say it again. Telling Guru. Talanguru, Nyan's Kunjaku. It's a lot easier when you can read it, but anyway. Um, fondly known as TN by most people. Nyan Kunjaku. Uh, and if you, if you go to the, if you go to talk to anyone in the park and you say, oh, we're going to TN, they know exactly where you're going. <laughs> um, so now that was, that was created back in 2005. So, the, so uh, Talanguru and Nyan Kunjaku is actually, it stands for, it's the place amongst the dunes. So they've built, they've, in the dunes there, they've actually built uh, a sunrise viewing area. And that sunrise viewing area, again, it's not looking directly back on to the rock for sunrise. It's looking where the sunrise is going to shine across to try and give that same effect yeah. uh, of the rock rising there. Uh, and it's a fabulous place to go and photograph. Um, just because at sunrise, let me get it there, we've got all of these beautiful um, Luke's favourite tree. Uh, mm. I love that she oak. Yeah, the she oak that's there. Mm. Uh, looking back out of it, it's getting a little bit overgrown when this photo was taken, but thankfully they've done a burn in the area there now, and it's kind of made the view a little better again now. Uh, but also a little further along from there, you just get this amazing view of the sunrise colours uh, coming across the rocks. And there again, Paul, you can see the striations coming through the rocks, mm. um, upside down scream, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, uh, across the rock there as well, and off in the distance, Kanajita, um, all the way, all the way off in the distance as well. Oh, so, but just from that one viewing area, just such an amazing array of 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 what you can see on the rock as the as the first light hits it during the day as well. But do you also you also have the option if you want not to go to that viewing area for sunrise? Can you? go closer to the rock and that sort of thing. Is so, yes, yeah, so you, could go, you could go on one of the walking tracks close to the rock. Um, one of the things we tend to, we do quite a lot, we do a lot in the, um, uh, during our Astro Tours, we actually go to Murijula Waterhole first thing in the morning, uh, mostly because when we're looking at the western fall of the Milky Way, we can park here, we can go and stand on this track and we've got the rock over on our right-hand side and we're looking out at the Milky Way falling over on the west. So, hey, can you see my mouse pointer moving there? Yeah, we can. It really shows the scale too, seeing those cars there versus... Yeah, the see, cars see the cars my there. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a bus. There's no buses yeah. going there at the yeah. um, so, uh, so, again, so we, we go there very early in the morning uh, on our Astro Tours because we get that amazing view of the rock in the Milky Way. Uh, mm. you can, to give you an example of... Uh, I've got one here. Do, do, do. This Just is to a, the right of... Oh, yeah. This is a panorama of it. So you can see here's that foot track with some of our clients down there. Actually, it goes and loops around underneath me. That's where the car park is. Yep. That little wall shit that's up there. And that's where the rock looks with the Milky Way standing over the top of it. So pretty spectacular spot. So mm -hmm. you could go to there for sunrise because uh, that actually gives you a, uh, again, if you're actually looking where, the, depending on the time of year, the sun could be shining straight in there for sunrise in the morning. Uh, I think you'd have to be there for you know middle of the summer, so like the, the hot time mm -hmm. um, to be there. Uh, but again, you would get that light shining straight the way all the way into Manajula Waterhole, and the light in there would be amazing because again, you'd have all of that orange of the rock just reflecting off all of the trees and all of the uh, all of the flora uh, that's around there as well. Uh, we were very fortunate this year. We went in uh, June, uh, the group we took, there were butterflies everywhere. Everything was green after all the rain that we've had and so many flowers around. So, um, including some um, stirred desert peas that, you know, haven't seen around there for a long time. And uh, there, were, there were lots of those growing around uh, as well. So it was, uh, yeah, it's a pretty spectacular in different seasons. Uh, but it's always worth thinking when you're going to go and actually looking at the spots you could go to as to the direction the sun is going to be shining in, mm. especially for sunrise and sunset. It's always a, like, I guess the sunrise and sunset viewing areas is what everyone does. And so that's the other thing. If you do 
chance to go up to the rock, you normally have a pretty, um, you might be the only one there, um, yeah. which is pretty cool for a place yeah. like that. Uh, and that's the thing, I think a lot, a lot most would, uh, the tendency is you find that, that generally uh, people who do go to Uluru, they'll go there for two or three days maximum. And so day one, they'll go and do the sunset viewing area. Day two, they'll go and do sunset out at uh, Kadiji. So day three, they'll probably go and have dinner um, and not go anywhere else. Uh, so yeah, so the tendency is you don't have people um, close up with a rock. So you tend, tend to have it quite free uh, to take lots of photos. Um, certainly there have been some changes in the past year. Uh, one of the uh, the big bus companies out there, Double AT Kings, now runs a barbecue every night. They run that barbecue just next to where it says the Marla Toilets here. Uh, they're actually set up there uh, and they do it as an astronomy, uh, astronomical um, uh, dinner. So they have an Aboriginal astron a, a astronomy guide there who, who goes through all of the constellations. And consequently, what happens is they actually light up this side of the rock um, for pretty much most of the night. You can see light reflecting off it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so again, so the, the change in tourism, which has probably changed again now um, over, you know, especially over the past year or through the pandemic, uh, uh, is kind of is increasing the, uh, the human interaction um at sunset and after sunset uh, around those areas of the park um so, so it's quite difficult now for us to even go in to do some astro shots uh just after sunset because we can't get a clear view of the rock anymore uh, we always have this one little portion of the rocks actually lit up um and it's lit up for pretty much the entire night that we're there uh, there's you know, light pollution even all the way out there unfortunately it's a yeah rock. Give you guys an idea. Pretty sure I've got a shot in here somewhere. Oh, I thought I had. Pretty sure I actually put more photos in here. Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. There we go. So you can see. So this is from the sunset viewing area, the Milky Way rising. So this will be just after last light. And you can see all of this light here, uh, which oh, is from is. this new barbecue. And that's that every night. That is a pain in the ass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I've actually I've got the details of the guys that run it now. So when we go out there, I can actually phone them up and say, "Hey, you're doing the barbecue today? Hey, when are you? Are, you, are there any nights you're not doing it?" So we can kind of arrange to go in and uh, and do it. But when is it but, ten o'clock? They pack up or something? It's quite yeah, about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. They pack yeah. up because they're in the we're constrained by our timing in the park. We're supposed to depart by eleven p.m. at the latest as a commercial operator. Wow. Um, and so they're under the same constraints as we are. So, uh, but the thing is going to change around the park probably in the next few years is there will be more of these changes in interaction, uh, uh, more human impact closer to the rock at later hours. Um, uh, and that's because of one thing that changed a couple of years ago or just prior to the pandemic, the, the major change at Uluru was the closure of the climb. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we don't talk about the climb so much as a guide, except to ask people not to do it. Now it's closed permanently, so we can't do it anymore, thankfully. And they took the chains down too, didn't they? The chains have now been taken down, even though yeah. there were apparently there was some heritage arguments about whether they actually had a heritage value, but they've actually been taken down and the rock <laughs> actually underneath repaired uh, using Arcos material huh? uh, to, to, actually, to actually repair it, to bring it back to its, to, to its natural state. Um, and again, there's, they're writing some fact sheets about that, so we've got that information to use as, uh, for, for the guides to use. But there's um, um, lost my track with that. So, uh, but when, since the climb closed, obviously they're looking at other ways to attract tourists to keep tourists coming back to the rock because otherwise you just have a bunch of walking tracks and this amazing uh, monolith. And you know, although there's a lot of cultural aspects to it that people can learn while they're there. Uh, sometimes people uh, don't show any things, don't they? Oh, <laughs> people aren't <laughs> cutting any more with their traditional families every year to do the pilgrimage climb uh, to the top of the rock. So it's changed the dynamic of tourism there. So it's there will be a theme park change. anymore. It's disgraceful. <laughs> Sorry, Lou? That was a bit cynical. It's not a theme park anymore. So, um, yeah. So it's, that's, a, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. It's not a theme park. That's right. That has never been a theme park, but yeah, but you, you're right. I mean, it's 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 one of the, it's one of those aspects. I mean, I'm sure uh, there might be people who are um, online with us tonight who 
have been out there on those you know family trips uh, and, and climbed it as part of a, a family trip as an annual thing. Um, and that can't that can't happen anymore. So so things have to will have to change in the park. So they're going to have to make some changes to to how tourism adapts around that uh, to, to to keep tourists coming and enjoying the national park. Um, hopefully, things in the way of learning more about the natural values, learning more about the cultural aspects of that will uh, will, will keep people coming. Um, but obviously, we need to see the international borders open back up <laughs> to, uh, to 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 keep that level of tourism coming through at the moment. Mm. And I guess that's where um, uh, the field of light comes into things as well. The, it's always meant to be finishing, but never seems to finish. It never seems to finish. Mm. It's very strange that um, field of light. Fans, it is. It is a fantastic experience. Things are very different at the moment. Um, if you do happen to go to Uluru kind of right about now, and difficult to do because most of us are in lockdown anyway, but even prior to that, only about a third of the resort is open uh, because they, um, well, we've not to put too fine a point on it, they've got some staffing problems. They can't get the staff to come back uh, after they all disappeared at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so consequently, the experiences that were normally out there have changed quite dramatically in, in some cases. Um, things like the Sands of Silence dinner, um, which is you know an award-winning experience, um, is still very much a thing uh, that you can do out there. Uh, but the field of light has really changed uh, what, what they used to offer. Do you have uh, a shot of that, Joe, just for the folks that... I do. Sure that um, what, what is the field of light? What are you talking yeah, there about? There we go. <laughs> Yeah, it's so been there for a while, Monroe, isn't it? You've probably he, seen pictures of it. Um, yeah, so Bruce Munro, who is a who's a British artist, um, uh, does these field of light installations uh, all over the world. Uh, there's one in Albany in WA as well. There's one there's one up in Darwin for a little while, but I think it's I think that one's actually finished now. Uh, basically, it's a field of a uh, hundred thousand glass spheres connected by fiber optic lights. Mm. Um, and so it creates a field of light like this. Uh, the one out at Uluru is the biggest it's ever done. Um, it's now been there for, what is it, five years it's been running there for? Now? Yeah, so five years. Um, so it's been there for quite a while. Uh, Can you show us where it is on the map, but just yeah. so I know where to avoid? Because it looks- <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, it's actually, I just it's actually pretty easy to avoid. Up. They, um, it, it's, they it's very, very much... Uh, yeah, it's very much a uh, um, uh, like a boutique resource resource experience. It's outside of the national park, um, so you'd never actually be in there if you're in the national park. But from the resort, um, you find the resort here. Um, you can actually see here. It's actually marked. There we go. Field of light. So in the oh. resort, you stay, you stay in one of these, um, you know, one of these amazing um, resort areas. I think only desert gardens and um, sales are the only ones that are open at the moment. Mm. Um, but uh, but yeah, you stay in one of these and they will pick you up in a bus and they will actually drive you out to the field of light. Yeah, um, and it's basically, it's in this, these are the dunes that you normally go and stand on if you're doing the dune experience, which you can't do at the moment. Uh, and then you're looking over this huge field of all of the spheres. And then you get to walk down and actually walk around inside them. Is that, uh, is that on every night, Jay, or just certain nights? Or? Yeah, just every every night. Um, oh, it's, it's, it's a... It's book it. Yeah, yeah, and I say it's looking like it's going to continue on. Um, I say it's when you, you've got to book it through the resort because it's you can't drive there and park there yourself and walk around. Yes. Um, it's very uh, much uh, yeah. you wouldn't you wouldn't know it was there. Um, like it's almost like it's a, the someone's way. magically taking you away into a you know blindfolding you and taking you there. So it's um in, in the in night it's you wouldn't know where you're going. So mm. yeah, yeah, right. Um, but it's. There are a lot of um, dunes around that area. Is it something that you're allowed to just walk yourself to? You know, and maybe some of them, yes. Uh, some of them, no. Some of them are actually private property. So, like they're around the field of light area here and out to Longitude 131. If yeah. anyone's not aware of Longitude 131, um, that's, you know, that's Butler um, service accommodation in villas that's way away from everybody else. Uh, so very much a, uh, rather than a $900 a night experience. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I'd say that so cynically. I really do. <laughs> but I've been going to Uluru since 2003 and I've camped most of the time I've gone there. So uh, I always feel very fortunate when we get to stay in a hotel. <laughs> but uh, all of the areas around here are owned by the resort. If you think the resort itself, the whole area around the resort outside the National Park is owned by one company. Uh, that's the Aboriginal Land Corporation. That includes the airport as well, doesn't it? Are they own the airport yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 So it's all ex-pastoralist property. Uh, was converted over to tourism um, uh, by Connell and Airways uh, back in 1950. Uh, and so that whole area is basically is owned by one company now, effectively. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's a monopoly. So that's why there is no other hotels there. Um, yeah. Uh, so it's uh, you know this it's all run by the the one the same company. So in answer to your question, Nick, yes, yeah, so a lot of these dunes are actually on private property. Um, some of them you can walk around, some of them you can't. The other ones that are actually um, we sometimes get access to the uh, camel dunes, uh, mm. the, where they run the Uluru Camel Tours, uh, famed for running the uh, the Uluru Camel Races every year, mm. um, and so they run their camel tours um, uh, every day, again for sunrise and sunset. And they take the camels up and around these dunes here. And again, these are part of a private property. You don't want to get caught by the camel ears invading their dune space when they've got a tour going on because mm. uh, um, they tend to come revving after you on quads and you know asking you lots of questions as to what you're doing there. Oh, <laughs> right, a bit like a bit like the, the border control between USA and Mexico, maybe. It kind of is. Uh, yeah. and, and I think I think we were you with me that day, Luke. I think you might have been in the helicopter. Yeah, I think they didn't know that we'd they already didn't know got that we, we got yeah. permission to be there, but they didn't, they didn't know pass we got it on. To be there, yeah. So um, yeah, but where's was, that other June Jay that um is the more public? I was just going to say yes, yeah, just outside yeah. of town, uh, just underneath the camel dunes here, you've got this one big long dune here. But just outside of town, you can park up on the side of the road here, and you can walk up onto this dune here. Yeah. Uh, and this dune here again has a sunrise view, and it has a great view. Actually, no, it's the bottom end of the camel dunes here. Mm. Um, in actual fact, it's the one that's behind the camel dunes. Sorry, I get it right. This one that's here with a little camera spot on top of it. Well, I guess I want to call it you to look out. I don't think that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But you, you drive just out of town and uh, you park up on the side of the road here and you just walk up on top of this dune here. And again, you for sunrise, you get an absolutely fantastic view out all the way across from there. Yeah, pretty it's far away though. You want a long lens for sure. Yeah. So, um, and that's what most of the time when people are asking about wanting to photograph all the room at nighttime, that's most of the time where. Uh, I end up sending people to go because they can't get into the national park um, after it closes. Um, but certainly from you know anywhere around there on either side of the road, if you were to stop and have a look up at the night sky, you'd, you'd see stars everywhere you go. Mm-hmm. And Jay, it's probably worth commenting on um, how that's you can't do that at all inside the park in terms of just going off um, off track. Um, or yeah, that, that's or right. I mean, it, again, it's one of those things that. Once we're across inside the park border, I'm showing a lot of Google Maps here. I should probably show some images in a minute. Um, let me show you. Let me grab this at the back end here. Here's our, uh, here's our photography thing about the rules. Okay, so this is straight out of the manual. <laughs> um, there's a lot of spots around the room we can't photograph, but the main and I would call it an issue. It is kind of an issue. Uh, when you come into the park, you see it quite a lot, is that people come through the park gate and almost immediately around the first bend, there is this incredible view of Uluru. And it's the first view people get uh, of, of, the rock, of the whole rock inside the National Park. So the first, um, uh, the, the, the first thoughts on people's minds is, let's pull up here and take a photograph. Even though actually alongside of the road, it actually says no stopping, no parking uh, oh. alongside the, the road. But people are still actually pulling up on the side of the road and getting out of the cars and stomping off into the dunes and going to take a photograph of themselves uh, of, of that first view of Uluru. Now, the problem is there is that um, what's been happening, and it's happened over the, they've actually got some photos of it in the uh, park's office where they're showing the recession of the vegetation on that particular portion of the road because so many cars are pulling up and so many people are walking off into the dunes that gradually over a decade, the vegetation has receded back by about 10 metres. 
And so that erosion into the park is now is starting to show significant impact when this is a you know, World Heritage Area um, that's, uh, that we're trying to protect and, and there are laws around it to protect it. Uh, so that's one of the issues of parking up on the side of the road anywhere you like and just taking a photograph because um, you know, you're going to be causing that kind of erosion. And there's also the traffic management and all of the other aspects. And then the traffic to that. Management yeah. And you'll get pulled up by a ranger quick smart if you if you um if you do pull over. Not, yeah. I haven't found that out by experience, but I've seen them pull other people. Yeah, we've over. seen it, we've seen it plenty of times. Uh, the guides have a certain um uh, we we kind of given a, a certain way to approach people and say, guys, do you realize the right thing to do here is not to pull over and um, you know, have that conversation in earnest with with people who may just not be aware um, that that's that's uh, that's an issue and explain why it is an issue and uh, try and persuade them to do the right thing. Sometimes that's not met with people want to do the right thing. Uh, but, you know, that's a reason to respect that wherever you see those no stopping signs is to not stop there. <clears throat> You'll also then, find... Sorry, Luke, go on. I know I was just going to... Um just going to refer to the the side that you can't photograph but i think you're just about to head mm. there yeah sorry i'll wow. take a bit of a drink um obviously uh, as you go around you'll see spots around where it's quite obvious you can't pull over um but there's also spots around the edge of the that you can't photograph uh for cultural reasons uh the main one of those is the whole of the northeast face uh, it's really a tricky one because that's uh, um, for sunrise. That's majority of the light that gets onto the rock is on that side of the rock. So ideally, people want yeah. to you know, would sometimes want to try and find that position to go and say, "Hey, where can I go and photograph this?" And you, you literally would, you know, culturally should not be photographing that part of it. There are so many sensitive sites across that side of Uluru that you would not be able to take a photograph of the entirety of the rock and miss those culturally sensitive sites um so that's how, why how's that information passed on to people jay is it like there are literally signposts out there or is it just yeah well so out, out in those locations paul you would see you'd see all the signs there quite a lot in fact i should actually have an example here i probably should try and dig one out you'll see signs as you're walking around the base of the rock uh or driving around the base of the rock you'll see signs that say sensitive site no photography from here and then you'll see a sign say when that area finishes um if you're on the base walk or on the road around here the road is all no stopping so you can't stop anyone on that road anyway um but all around there as well you'll see the signs to say sensitive sites no photography uh, oh. so it's you, also you're allowed, you're allowed to walk around the base though you, you can walk around the base yeah yeah and you'll see every one of these signs it's not it's not frowned upon no, no, not um, at all. Not at okay, all. If I, and and only want people to come and, and enjoy the walks and and come and enjoy the uh, the the landscape. The uh, walk did used to go closer to that side of the rock, so they actually made it quite it a bit did, further. They made it oh, they literally lifted it away. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah, because it used to run all the way along the very very base. Yeah, that's what that was my understanding. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that wasn't actually that long ago. When I came into three, mm. we were actually walking right up against the base, um, at the base of the rock, all the way around. Uh, but that got receded back quite a way. The old track is still there, but you can still see it. But uh, but now you're. Yeah, the, the walk actually goes quite a lot, quite a way further back. Uh, but all the way along there, you'll see the signs that say no photography, no photography, no photography, no photography. Yeah. Is there, um, apart from being culturally sensitive, do you have any explanation as to what that sensitivity is for that particular part of the rock? Yeah, so um, I'm given limited information as a guide. Okay. Um, I'll show you the other picture I've got here. Um, there we go. That one there. Uh, it's actually out of my education materials. This is the stuff that we're given. Um, so this is the northeast face here. So we've got sensitive site, sensitive site, sensitive site, sensitive site. All these SSs that are here are all different locations that are um, there. Um, they have a particular part in one of the stories associated with Uluru. Now, as I say, I mentioned earlier that as a guide and what I, the stories I can pass on are the ones that are taught to children. Uh, some of these locations may have ceremonial um, implications, but the majority of these in Uluru uh, will be part of a story that is not authorised to be passed to anybody else. Right. There's also a rule around some of that that 
the way the Tukapur works is that with these sensitive sites is that they may contain some aspect of one of those stories that can only be given to appropriate persons. And so taking a photograph of that means that that can be shown to anybody. Right. Yep. Uh, and so there's a there's an eagerness to make sure that those photographs are not picked up and not passed to people who would not normally be um, allowed to know or see that part of the area. Mm. Uh, there's a particular significance between men and women as well. Uh, as in most Aboriginal cultures, there's men's business, there's women's business. Yep. Um, very much there is a difference between men's and women's business in Uluru and Kanajita. Um At Uluru, many of the stories may be uh, associated with women, and therefore men are not supposed to know the stories associated with those areas. Oh. So the same thing. And at a Kanajita, Kanajita is still very much an active ceremonial men's business. And so we don't have any stories to tell about Kanajita for that oh. reason. Um, so, so, as they, so we... Just you know, we'll just go to kind of use it to appreciate it. That's what we're asked to do, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't. We're never told any actual stories about it. So that's the basis behind those cultural sites. Is that you know we don't want to take photos because there may be uh, a ceremonial impact or cultural significance about that area that can't be shown to anybody else. Yeah, right. Um, is the old track the one? If you're looking at the map there and say at number fourteen and fifteen, is the old track the the one that's going near those, or is that the new track? Uh, the new that's track. the old one. The new one actually goes because you can actually see the old airfield. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> just just above it. When you go past that on the road, the new track actually goes a little further out. Yeah, this way. Yeah. Um, as I say, the old track is still visible. It's still there, but this this picture from Google or whatever aerial imaging they used to create it would have been. Way before 2005, I think it was when that track was changed over. That was part of the um, the building works or the the uh, remedial works they were doing for um, TN when they built the place amongst the dunes uh, for the Sunrise area. So, uh, so yeah, so you'd still see that track there. You'd still see the track connecting, um, uh, or the old road that connects between where the uh, beginning of the Marla Walk is on the corner here. And takes you around to um, oh, takes you around to Munajula Waterhole here. Uh, that track that goes around had a road next to it as well. That road's not there anymore. It's the, the road's still there, but it's now sealed off. There's a much longer road you have to go around to get to those locations now. Right. And that's just been so to, so to keep everybody out of the. Uh, you can see it on this map here. You can see how much greenery. There is around the base of the rock. It's very much an active ecosystem around the base of the rock there. So they're trying to obviously they're keeping the traffic further and further away from it and trying to keep the foot traffic away from some of those more sensitive areas. Because wow. there's a lot of water holes and, and things around the base that the, the animals and you know animals rely on um, to, that, to support. That's right. And, and Ananu would have relied on as well before you know they had facilities in, in other locations mm. in the park. Absolutely. Um, right. So I'm just looking at Google again. Um, Sorry to, to <laughs> I, I'm sure other people have got these questions that haven't been there like me, but um, when you look at the, the Mutajulu waterhole yep. um, on Google, there's a track, um, the track that goes off to the east there along the base. Is that closed? No, no, no that, that, one. that, that, one's, that one's open. So, so the, this... one that, the one that goes all the way from Mutajulu waterhole to the public toilet to the east, is yep. that track yep. open? Yep, yep. that track's open. Yeah. Right. So the, okay. the entire base walk that goes all the way around. This is the new track. Yep. Goes all the way around. This is the old one. Yep. Um, so this is the that's the old airfield. Still yep. with, You can see the um. You can see where the campground is too. Through uh, the campground yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah. So uh, campground. Yeah, so that's pretty close to the rock. That old airfield. Yeah. So with the camp, the campground used to be right next to the rock as well, um, yeah. where um, uh, uh, where Lindy Chamberlain um, uh, lost the little one. So oh, that yeah, was. Right. Yeah, that, that was right next to the rock at the time. And obviously that that's was, near the Marla Park. Marla Park yeah, it's on the other side here. It's where the toilet tiles are around here now. See that cleared patch but, there. Yeah, but that whole southern side, the walk that's visible there that goes right against the base, that's yeah. currently open. That's, and, that's all open, yeah. So that yeah. entire walk all the way around the rock there, all the way around, um, yep. duck into Kenji Gorge and back, and I've got long Marla, and then all the way back around uh, the look at a walk and all the way back again. You could do that whole uh, that whole walk uh, eight kilometers in total. 
yep. um, to, to get you from all the way around the base. Um, uh, just take water. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and you, you can, can, also and you can rent bike. bikes and you yeah. can rent Segways as well. So yeah. you can, you can, yeah. Oh, no, Segways. Oh, dear. Oh, well, I got Segways. Oh, no. <laughs> uh. Yeah. All right. Well, I think um, we, we probably should just give a little bit of love to Cutter Judah um, as well. I'm just oh, just, to, just one more yeah. question. Sorry, before you go, I, I noticed on the graphic that you had before, um, which showed um, there was a thing that said, no, not that one, the one of the red. Yeah, yeah, that one. Um, it says no entry. Um, it wasn't that one, actually. It was a similar one. It says no entry there. And I think that leads to... That's Munajulu that. itself is that off? Yeah, that, that's, that's right. So that's yeah. So Munajulu, the township in Munajulu. Yep. Uh, it's a closed community. So right. You, you, have you have to have a mission to go there. Uh, sure. Okay. Cool. Yep. They, they did. They do have. They've got a. They've got a post office. They've got a police station. Um, uh, they've got a small hospital there. Um, you know, it's it's. A, but it is a closed community, right. uh, especially at the moment because it's also a community that would be. Very heavily impacted uh, in the event of having a COVID, a COVID infestation going through there. So, and the other thing too that you can see sometimes is um, uh, people from the community can still access the park at night, obviously because they live there. Uh, but sometimes they'll drive in front of the of Uluru, and we can get some quite interesting effects when we do long exposures at night um, of the, the car lights, lights going across, across the yeah. across the front as well. So, yeah, mm, so it's active area. Mm. Yeah. Right, sorry for the dumb questions, but I'm just no, you know, yeah. no, okay. never, never been there, and 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 you know I certainly wouldn't want to uh, get myself into any trouble doing the wrong thing. So yeah. I mean, you, you you would you would you would know straight away, Nick, as well. It's I mean, it's 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 one of the, the unfortunate things about uh, the national park is that they've had to put so much signage up. Yeah. Um, in some of the cases that takes or that distracts from the natural environment you're in. You know, coming walking around a a uh, very remote track that's barely got any infrastructure on it. It's barely even marked. And suddenly you see a sign that says, please don't photograph. And you think, well, that sign's out of place. It shouldn't be there. Uh, yeah. But it's there for a good reason. Um, and the cool. same with a lot of the other signs and things, it's there as well. Um, it's unfortunate that's had to happen over time because people have done the wrong thing. Um, uh, but, you know, if you would, you would get these maps in the visitor guide, uh, these maps are published everywhere around the resort. Uh, and in the national park itself. So it's unlikely that you would be in a position where you would go, oh, I'm doing the wrong thing. Um, they also route the traffic pretty well, so you wouldn't accidentally find yourself there. You'd have yeah. to really go out of your way to, to be in a place that you shouldn't be. Yeah. 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 If, if you were lucky enough to be there when it was um, raining uh, heavily to get those beautiful waterfalls that, that come off um, Uluru, what's a part of Uluru that you would go to to do that? I, I, I notice that the, the northeast side, which is completely off limits, the photography has got a lot of um, water channels running down, which would look spectacular, but you can't photograph those. So yeah. where, where, where would you yeah, go? In, retreat, in actual fact, it's the northwest face. Northwest face. You want to be going on, which is the Marla Walk, which you can photograph. Well, you can photograph it up to Kanji Gorge. Yep. Uh, that's still quite a lengthy way. Pretty much every photo you would see, even Ken's photos of water coming off Uluru, are taken along that face. Mm. Yep. Um, Kanji would be incredible with water. Also, Murajulu would be um, also Murajulu Waterhole would be a great place. As absolutely. Well. And if you yeah. if you think, uh, if I go back to my survey view here, I can find it. So here we go. So Kanji Gorge, that big black scar coming down off the top of Kanji Gorge, yeah. waterhole underneath is is the water direction. Mm, um, so yeah, amazing. To one of the other ones that's not Kanji Gorge, uh, which I'll have in here somewhere. Sorry, guys, let me bring it back to my knock on my server over here. Oh, we, we want to see photos. This is great. <laughs> um, in fact, I might have to show you a nice image of it because I don't think I've got a. It's going to be in here somewhere. Is that the, the, the pool itself? At the Munajulu waterhole. Yeah. yeah. Um, Is that over the lift there? That one? No, that's actually it's kind of due to, I'll come to that. Uh, oh. Sorry, guys. I'm just I'm flitting around trying to find it because I know I've got a picture of it in here somewhere. Pretty sure I put one in here. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I took it out because it was pretty well, bad. I might, might come across it later. 
Ah, oh, there it is, a star trail. Oh. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Yeah. So that's actually going to do the water hole. Now you think it's actually much bigger than that when you get up to it. That was taken with a 12 mil lens oh, yeah. doing a star trail. Um, hideously, you can still see a plane going over the top. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh. Don't get away from that even in Uluru, by the way. Um, bear in mind, I always say this to people, is that bear in mind Uluru is actually right slap bang in between Melbourne and Singapore. Mm. So every flight that goes from Melbourne to Singapore flies yeah, directly over the top right. of Uluru. You right. can't get away from planes anywhere you go. But you can see here, you can actually see the black scarring down mm -hmm. the rock into Munaju, the water hole underneath. Yeah. It actually comes right down from the peak where the climb used to go right up to the top of. Um, that's where that starts. That's why the climb was such a problem because environmentally people would toil this at the top of the rock and then that would come flooding off down to the water holes. Yeah. Um, so again, so I'm going to do the water hole as well under heavy rain would have all of this, all of these mm. uh, lumps and skips in the rock would just be absolutely flooding with water. Oh. Not worth actually getting up there for. Yeah. Yeah. You can say why he's got that magic bank account, can't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, seriously, seriously, as soon as the forecast, it's just um, what, um, if we're out of lockdown, no. um, I think it's booked. I'm going. All right. Well, let's, um, we, we should go to some more picks, but we, we didn't really cover off um, Cutter Judah, and that's still a very important part. Um, as let's well. talk about Cutter Judah. In fact, we saw the map before. Okay. So, um, Cutter Judah, all the way out here, let's say 50 kilometers away from Uluru. Uh, it's quite a distance um, and much bigger than Uluru in terms of the area. But the area of the Kanajusa that we always normally see, you've got the Kanajusa Dunes area, which some people will go to for sunrise. You have this huge, oh, sorry guys, it might be a bit noisy in here. I've got a helicopter buzzing just outside my house. What have you done, Jay? What have you done? <laughs> Is it'll, it probably, it'll probably be a search and rescue. That's the FBI. So, yeah probably be search and rescue because there's been a few up here in the past few days um what are they doing out and about people should be at home locked down exactly <laughs> now we're allowed to exercise within our lga so we don't have any you know 10 kilometer limits and stuff in our lga uh, blue man's lga is like a hundred dollars like a million hectares worth of space that we can exercise in so oh, wow. there's been a few people going off for, oh hey i'm not working i'll go for a long hike and i've never done it before um and then not coming home at night and yeah having to get searches out so uh there's been a lot of uh, education going on about the benefits of having a plb recently <laughs> so <laughs> anyway well i'll come to talking about the blue mountains again um so yes yeah, so i had a kind of user here so sometimes you go to the dunes viewing area here which gives you this beautiful view and that's where you can actually you can see kind of use of the slope from the front of kind of use all the way down to towards the back uh, which is where this 45 degree uplift occurred. But the most, the, the honey spot that I like to call it, which is all the way around the other side, is where you're going to photograph it from. Because the photographs from the side here, uh, if you try to have published them commercially or get approval to publish them commercially, they wouldn't be approved. Well, they would be under certain conditions, but. Um, nine times out of 10, they wouldn't be approved because the actual rule for photography at Katajuta is that all five heads must be in shot. And we, oh. say, we say heads because Katajuta actually means many heads. Yeah, uh, and you have so to look at the, the ground view. To, you have to look at the ground view, which we'll come to in a few moments. Yeah. So, so you drive all the way around this road here and all of this road around here, uh, I'll actually go onto the map. The photography map. All of this road around here is a no stopping zone, and it's a no stopping zone for exactly that reason to stop people taking photographs at the angles that won't be approved, or again, they don't want uh, yeah. uh, they don't want though that image um, uh, to to become public uh, for cultural reasons. So again, so you'll see there's no stopping on that road all the way around. Once you get to the sunset viewing area or up into Alba Gorge, um, you can take as many photos as you like, but then you're actually looking across the front of the rock and you're looking at all five heads all together. Now you'll notice you go on the Valley of the Winds walk. Now, if anyone is going to go to all the rooms not been before, if you plan to do Valley of the Winds, go prepared, take lots of water with you. It's a lot more arduous than people would think, uh, especially if you're doing it on a hot day, you'll need a lot of water. Uh, but the scenery is beautiful but you can't photograph it. 
And for that same reason that this is part of the men's business uh, is that for the same reason you can't photograph in there is that there are a lot of cultural and ceremonial areas uh, in the Valley of the Winds. Uh, used a lot at night, um, which I have come across in the past um, when I've been out there. And uh, you get requested to uh, not stay in the area um, if, there's, uh, if there is uh, uh, yeah, potentially a ceremony um, happening. So, uh, so it's one of those areas that, again, you just got to respect that it'll have no photography signs all the way through it. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, if you take photographs personally, uh, if you ever try to get them approved uh, commercially, it would never happen. Um, it's probably worth um, noting as well that um, it makes aerial photography of Cutter Judah very challenging as very well. Challenging. If you need the only the five domes in the shot, it make a lot of um, uh, Cutter Judah shots you may have seen are probably um, would be hard to get an approval of um, for a commercial use. Mm. So, so should, but, but for personal for, for personal shots, so. Um, well, it's, uh, it's more about just the respect of the, the wishes it's, of it's the, the traditional owners. I mean, so. per, per personal shots, it never, it was never seen as really being an issue, but personal shots now get posted on Instagram. They get posted on Facebook. And I know yeah. some people wouldn't do that. They'd say, no, well, they hang on the personal. For me, I might print them and stick them on my wall, but nine times out of ten for most now, they end up on social media. Yeah. That's effectively the same as... Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, okay. so, yeah. Yeah. So as guides, we've been asked recently, it's happened in the past six months, where we've been uh, basically asked to any clients that we take into the park uh, to try and ask them to respect um, the, the, the cultural aspects of the photography uh, uh, as well and not capture any of these images. Hmm. Uh, sorry, guys, that helicopter's particularly loud. <laughs> <laughs> it's, almost like, it's almost like it's yeah, landing yeah, it's in the park. So um, some good noise cancellation going on. Yeah. Uh, so here's, here's the, the class. This is from the sunset viewing area. So here's that classic shot of all of the heads of all the room. Uh, so actually five heads there. You've got the one, two, three, four, and five. What you've got here is you've got Welper Gorge, which is this one gorge that runs up through the middle here. And then off on the side here, you've got the track that goes up and around into um, uh, Valley of the Winds. Mm. Both call value of the waters, but here in the mountain. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, so again, so the area is actually is quite vast. Across the front of the rock, there is about a kilometre and a half uh, in terms of the distance from end to end. So, and I think I actually think it might be longer than that. Some people don't realise just how big it is when they see these big kind of front-on images. But if you were going to try and take a photograph of it, that you were going to use for commercial reasons you'd actually want to have all five of these heads in place. And there's also a rule around um, Welper Gorge, isn't there, around um, having to have um, both sides of the valley walls? That's right. Let um, me get to a Welper Gorge image here. Yeah. Here we go. No one here, a tangy, uh, Pat Tang, uh, who came with us ah, a couple of years ago. Patty. This is This is the walk up through Welper Gorge. And um, you yeah, have a lot of crisscross. Um, I don't know if you guys, uh, Luke, we went there to do some Astro this year. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys actually got any shots from there or processed anything yet. Um, uh, sure so, on. but uh, yeah, I think that'd be pretty spectacular because the Milky Way was just setting right in between the rock here. So, oh, wow. uh, pretty, pretty spectacular spot to be, uh, um, uh, to be, uh, actually, no, we went very early in the morning. That's right. So it was setting off in a different direction, but it was, uh, yeah, sometimes you'd actually get the Milky Way rising up between the, the, the crevasse there. Um, so if you think this track that runs all the way through, uh, I'll just try and do a quick shadows on that one. Sorry, you can see it a bit better. There you go, just bring it up a little bit. So, oh, God, that's, mm -hmm. there we go, go back to there. Um, so, you know, so you can see all the way through that little track that runs all the way through across the rock. This actually gives you an example, actually, of you know how Calajutes is formed. So you can see these boulders lying around. You know, these boulders would have come out of these holes in the rock, mm. right up above you, and off on the side here as well. These little holes, and again, it's because of all of this compressed rock surrounded by mud that's eroded away over time. It's a very, very different environment to Uluru, which is this big solid chunk. 
uh, of Arco stone, this conglomerate rock here uh, is much more susceptible to erosion, which is why these big gullies have, uh, have been carved out through erosion. Uh, and there's actually water that comes down through the middle here as well. So there's a little creek bed. So again, when it rains, it all floods in. Uh, and that fills up the environment there or fills up what they call pulley, which is uh, a name for an environment which is based on a creek bed or around a water hole uh, where you get a lot of uh, greenery and vegetation and therefore uh, birds and animals that can be hunted. Um, so yes, yeah, this track that runs through. Uh, any of the shots that you want to try and get of, Canada, of Walpa Gorge should have both sides of the walls of the gorge visible in the photo. Shouldn't, if you, especially if you're trying to do it commercially, uh, you shouldn't have any shots which is just looking at one wall on either side or you know, focused on a different different area. They should always have both walls in there. Mm. And that's actually so it's identifiable. So as a location goes, it's identifiable as a as a as a location. Uh, this is definitely a photograph of Welper Gorge. It couldn't be anywhere else around Coda Duty because you wouldn't be allowed to go there. Uh, so it's more about an identification. It sort of rules out taking sort of intimate detail shots and and that sort of thing. Kind like of I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in the patterns on the wall, et cetera, um, yeah. but it sort of make that not appropriate. But it also challenges you. I want to take an intimate shot, but I'm going to get the, oh, both sides in. How do I do that? <laughs> mm. Is it true that um, in some cases they may approve things if um, there's no um, identifiable... Like there's no just, identifiable... It's hard yeah. to know where it could have been taken anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, unless still, it's obviously it's a cultural sign, in which case yeah. no, this is obviously a cultural it's, sign. It's but. always worth just to, you know... Um, you know, if you've done things um, sensitively and, and just um, check with the, the parks media team, they're pretty reasonable people. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. probably a good, good way of approaching it. I was actually hoping they would come on board with this tonight, but, I, mm. but yeah, they've not really responded to, to coming. Yeah, I, was, I was wondering about that too. Yeah. Not, not, not many of them there at the moment, so it's mm. a little different to get busy. their time. All right, let's. Um, I think we've we've covered that off pretty well, um, Jay, with the, in yeah. terms of the spots. So, yeah, feel free to... Um, get through the pickies and should we have a look at some photos? Yes, <laughs> all right. Let's talk about a fire. It's not a great photo, actually. I thought I thought I'd pick the better one out of them, but uh, um, fire management at Uluru is quite an important cultural uh practice. Uh, you, you guys down in Tasmania probably would have had this as well, as there would have been a lot of discussion recently about um. Uh, traditional fire management and um, um, yeah. indigenous fire management practices and how we've lost that over time and how we need to now bring that back because they've been managing the land with fire a lot longer than we've been here. Uh, so we should be paying attention to some of their elders as to how they're doing that. And that's certainly happening a lot more here in New South Wales now after the bushfires uh, back in the 2019. Um, but at Uluru, traditional fire management's been in place for... Um, for a long time, um, going back almost centuries, because fire used to be used to um, uh, as a me as a mechanism to enable travel. So, uh, as Anna knew, wants to travel from one location to another because they were still a nomadic uh, a nomadic group. Um, they were walking barefoot through spinifex. Uh, if anyone's tried to walk barefoot through spinifex, they would know. Yeah, what happens. It's a little bit spiky. Uh, and so they would use fire management to burn patches of land in order to be able to travel. That would also generate root growth, uh, um, uh, plant growth. Uh, plants would come back, sprouts would come up, that would bring animals into an area, uh, and then those animals could be hunted. Uh, and so there's this whole traditional fire management practice that happens in Dillery Cottages National Park. Now, we wouldn't have seen it back in when you know, when it was being fully managed by Ananu, um, years before European settlement came in place. Uh, but we're often told if we could see a satellite view of what it would look like, it would look like a patchwork of fields. So you'd actually have almost distinctly square mosaic of patterns of burned areas um, around the National Park because they don't actually would only burn areas in a mosaic pattern. Um, so preserving some areas, letting them grow while they burn others. So when you go out to Uluru, and we get on to my point, if you see a fire, you don't tend to have to worry about it. 
if you actually know that there'll be rangers around who are actually managing that, who are using that traditional practice uh, to burn a particular area. It's used quite aggressively uh, at, at Uluru Kanji International Park at the moment. Um, so a lot of rain, so there's been a lot of growth. So they'll be doing a lot of burning uh, as we come into the summer months to, uh, to make sure areas are, uh, are kept low risk uh, of wildfire and grass fire. Um, but uh, yeah, if you actually go out there, you'll tend to see burning happening on the side of the road. You're driving right past it. And uh, sometimes you might think, do I really want to be driving through here? And But you pretty much know that that fire would not be occurring there um, uh, unless it was being managed because it's it's managed so it's managed so well. And you can get unlucky, um, like it can uh, impact your uh, photos if you're there. It, um, yeah, it happens right. to have a certain patch burning, but I think, Jay, you've got a shot where it's sort Especially of... Especially for night out. photography, but yeah, but you know, but that can sometimes also augment your photos. Mm. So that's yeah, not the moon rising there. in the background there. That's a fire burning off behind the roof. What's the, what's the fire burning season or is it all year round or...? Pretty much all year round, uh, but generally you know, it'll be round about sort of now as we're coming into back, back into the wet season, coming into into, uh, into summer. Um, so beginning sort of round about June, end of June, early July, um, and so you tend to find a lot of burning going on around about then. So this was actually in July. That first photo there, I think that was in June. That was when me and Luke went out to do an astro workshop. Mm. This one was actually mid July. Uh, I took a client out there. Um, this was at the fire itself was actually outside the national park. So it was actually in a property um, way off in the distance. But once you could see that fire burning off, uh, off in the distance there, uh, most people look at this image and say, wow, I didn't think you'd ever get the moon rising over <laughs> the horizon like that. And it's actually oh, yeah, actually, right. Yeah. Actually, the fire burning off in the distance there. So, you know, so fire, Uluru and Milky Way, it's kind of a unicorn photo. Mm. Just all you need in there now, Luke, is some zodiacal light, yeah, uh, an iridium flare, um, and a planet. Well, I know all the big yeah. words now. <laughs> yeah, I have some examples of you might have some zodiacal light um, examples, do you, Jay? Just to kind awesome. of um, I've, I've got one anyway. Um, I can show a bit yeah. later, but um, it's oh, a I... phenomenon where um, light gets scattered by um, well, the the, the last rays of the sun um sort of after tw in the twilight as it's dark um has been scattered by space dust in the atmosphere and creates a cone of light um which is quite spectacular actually out at Uluru if you get a good I don't know what conditions require a good viewing probably just high transparency in the atmosphere uh, yeah. but it can be very very vivid um as a as a feature at yeah. night Ooh. um so the rest of the shots I've got here are just pretty much of you know varying different sunrises and sunsets, uh, in actual fact sunsets for these ones. Um, and again, depending on you know amounts of cloud you might have coming through, is going to really kind of depict sort of the color that you're going to be able to get uh, coming through in the rock, and certainly the contrast in some of those areas as well. Uh, also, I think this shot was probably a yeah, this would have been shot on the Canon before I moved over to Sony. Uh, but again, you can see how much contrast is, is able to be brought out in, uh, in in those areas there. The interesting thing about photographing kind of this is from the sunset viewing area. So very easy to access. You have a whole row of cars by the side of you there. Oh, hang on. There we go. Oh. <laughs> giving the game away a bit there, probably for some people who might be online with us there. Mm -hmm. That disappeared too. There we go. So that's when you spin the mouse wheel. Um, but also be you, all that spin effects in front of you, sometimes it will get burned, uh, so you get a better view. Uh, sometimes it'll be quite high, so it actually starts to interrupt the view. They tend there to was get... a, that little sapling that um, disappeared. That's right, it disappeared. Yeah. Actually, it's there, I think. Mm. I think it's that that one there. Oh, that little twig, yeah. Yeah, there we go, oh, little branch. Yeah. For some reason, this year, this year it disappeared. Yeah, there's a, it's a, like a, looked like there was going to be a new little tree obstructing the view. I mean, that's got to be one of the most photographed trees in, in Australia, that tree in front of Uluru there. The tree in so, front of Uluru yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll show you because we had that shot of, there we go, yeah. of everything actually listed up in the front. As you know, it's not in that one. It would have been in another one. But, uh, yeah, so with a, a ranger down the road from us shining his car headlamps because he was trying to help somebody out of a ditch uh, right across all of the trees on the front. So it was almost perfectly illuminated across all the trees across the front of Uluru there. Uh, but yeah, that tree there tends to be yeah the most photographed tree, probably in the world. Uh, no, that that would be um, uh, that would be Wanaka, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> uh, 
No, I don't reckon. It used I'd, to be. Before well, volume wise, I'd pick Hillary any day. Um, so yeah, so you know, depending on the conditions, they're really going to differ the color that you see at sunset. Sometimes it's going to be orange. Sometimes it's going to be red. Uh, sometimes you'll see the actual the sand in the ground will be that you know the the dirt will be that deep red color as well with the sun coming over. Uh, sun rises. I think I showed you this shot before. You know, clear sky again. You can actually see the belt of Venus. Mm. Across there, that kind of mm. violety band that's just across the sky there. That means it was just an insanely yeah. clear morning. Mm. Uh, not ideal for landscape and sunrise and sunset, but still, you, you know, oh, the, there's some... shadow as well with the bluer patch there. Yeah. 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 There you go. There's shadow across the blue patch on the side there. So, but you know, again, having that beautiful light casting across the rock that way, showing off all the contrasting lights. Yeah. It looks uh, so dimensional, that light. Absolutely, yeah, and it's, uh, it's one of my favorite. This is one of my favorite photos, Bullaroo. Um, it's a particular spot. You've kind of got to, you can just about get yourself a little further to the right, so you can actually get the whole of the rock in and don't have this um, the shioke in the way. Uh, was that this year, Jay? Or? No, that was okay. uh, it's probably clearer now. So that would have been yeah. twenty eighteen. Yeah. What's your what's your focal length there, Jay? Uh, that's a panorama. That's a pano, I think. Is that a pano? Yeah. You could go I will um bring up the overlay with the image details. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been a panel because it's up at 32 mils. So um so it would have probably would have been with my old Tamron 2870. So just just for clarity, if you were to step off where you're standing and go forward a bit, you'd be A, not allowed to do it, and B, you'd be standing in front of a whole bunch of other photographers. That's right, yeah. Yeah, good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that's right, yeah, because just underneath my feet here would be a chain uh, that's a do not cross. So don't, right. go, don't go wandering off into the spin effects from that point. Uh, this is from TN, so this is from Talanguru Nankajaku, the, the place amongst the dunes. Lots of spots that you can stand, but there is one particular spot at the very front you can walk down to, uh, which mm. is the photographer's favourite, and you get that view all the way across the plane there. It's quite uh, good because the bus groups go to the higher lookout and generally there's... Yeah, because just behind there's a, there's, a, there's a metal uh, gantry um, uh, higher up behind you that people go and stand on. Yeah. Uh, you want to come down to this view of the frontier. So for one, your shots aren't shaking on that metal gantry when people are walking around. Sure. Uh, but also here, you're right down um, in, in the spin effects at the front there. Is there any, um, any restriction on not showing the whole rock um, from these... Viewpoints like I, I'd like to zoom in with a telephoto lens and, and get some of those. Um, yeah, not, not on this side. No, not a very good shot. I didn't pro I haven't processed that, so the horizons all skew anyway. Uh, I was just trying to get the sun sunlight. So uh, there are certain caves and and aspects to it that are, you know, there's very small um, cultural sites that if you did just happen to focus on might actually be an issue. But because the in the grand side of the the larger scale it's such a small part that it's not an issue so it just depends on if you have to happen to pick something that is sensitive yeah so from this side here this is where you're at from that photo looking yeah. here so you're actually looking across the road uh but you don't see it um you're looking across this area here where there's no sensitive sites yeah, yeah. yeah. so the sensitive the sensitive sites start at uh can pity which is right at the top end there uh where there's a bunch of boulders as long as you don't have those boulders in your photo uh, that that shot's okay um, to capture. Yep. Uh, Polari, you can you would is actually is the ground in front of that area, uh, not the actual rock itself. Yep. Um, so so again, you don't get that in the photo uh, yep. when you when you're shooting from there. So yep. uh, so yeah, so that that sh that shot's okay. And again, you can see there. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go back to it. Whereas I've done quite a few shots where I've kind of zoomed in there. Um, again, this was quite overgrown from a different spot on that lookout. Upside down screen, I like to call it. Yeah. Uh, that's probably not culturally appropriate, but I call that anyway. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was looking specifically at that. I mean, that would make a, a beautiful telephoto shot yeah. um, the, with the glow just starting to happen on it or something like that. And um, a few other spots there, just, yeah, beautiful. Let's see how detailed that shot is. There you go. Not hugely detailed, but yeah, but you've got a, you, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful spot of the rock and just even getting all of the, 
yeah. the striations going up from the erosion, uh, other waterfalls coming down the side here, so capturing some of those spots using from a long focal range. Yeah. So on that side, of the, on that side, you're you're okay. There's no cultural sensitivity there uh, okay. to be concerned about. Uh, I always just find from that position at sunrise, it's the best position to be in to photograph. Uh, and certainly from that particular spot, if you can just get that little further to the right, pretty sure I would have had somebody stood next to me mm. who was a little more important than me on this occasion. Yep. Um, so, but just getting that one spot there where you can get the whole rock in between those two, um, uh, those two she -oaks. Awesome. Jay, so probably got about 15 or so minutes, um, just so you oh, know. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, mate, you know I like to yammer on. No, that's all right. It's very, <laughs> it's all fascinating. Right. You're not going to get much more detail than um, how detailed Jay goes into things. It's very, we, we, we've talked about Kanji Gorge a lot already, but uh, I think this is Luke's favourite tree in the Lurie. I love that, yeah. Um, it's not original. Oh, it's been done before. but it's been um, done before, yeah. but yeah. the trick here is uh, getting right down underneath the bottom of the tree and not stepping off the, the track because you're actually on a metal gantry uh, as a track there uh, and actually getting a wide enough lens that you get the whole of this trunk and try and get the whole of this tree exposed outside of the rock. It's a good um, exercise in separation trying to get the tree to fit into that that um, that area by moving around a bit and as the tree gets bigger it's probably harder to get that separation. Get that separation yeah mm. yeah and it, it's a bit of exercise good, good exercise and actually getting down on your back Mm -hmm. uh, looking straight up in the air um, and trying to get your camera wide enough to be able to capture it. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so that's out of Kanji Gorge, a great spot. Another great thing you can be doing out there is take a helicopter flight. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm calling sunset as being probably the best time to do heli flights if the yeah. conditions are right. Um, I've not done a sunset flight yet. I know Luke has. Is that, is that because it lights up the part you're more allowed to? To photograph. And you're to photograph. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's a few reasons, but yeah, that's the main one. Um, also, I think it's just a bit easier from a logistic perspective. You don't have to get up so early. It's not so cold as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mainly the the bits that are lit up are the bits you want to shoot. Yep. Yeah. Whereas this right, this one for sunrise, this would have been in June as well. Uh, you know, you got the sun is just casting up on this side of the rock here. When you do the water hole, is actually just this little bit inside here. Uh, the township of Bunajulu um, off down to the side here. So, so oh. this again, this is that side of the rock upside down screen is there. So this is that side of the rock again um, that, you, that you, you can actually photograph. So again, so would have had to do a lot of shadows lifting on this image. Um, Are you more likely one. to get sort of dust in the air and stuff from a long day of wind than in the evening than in the morning? Or? If it's a windy day, but I think, I mean, I've only been out there when, a, when there's been a dust storm. Well, it wasn't even a dust storm. It was just windy. But again, you don't tend to have the dust there in the morning. Uh, you might have it whipped up during the day, but at night time, it just doesn't seem to be windy there at all. So you tend to well, Yeah, that's what I meant from the aerial perspective. You know, if you've got uh, your visibility is potentially lower in the evening than the morning I was, I was wondering yeah i don't think it's yeah you have to have those conditions right uh we sent them to group the last trip we were on they went up they did the evening flight but it was a little bit too cloudy so they didn't quite get the color on the rock uh but again perfectly still day so you didn't get any dust up in the air um it's such a clear horizon there anyway you would tend to cut through that really well with your camera i would think you you wouldn't get so much haze there just um, on helicopters, and I'm not a helicopter person, but um, looking at Google, um, are there opportunities and is it culturally appropriate? Um, are you able to photograph uh, Lake Amadeus from the air? Because yep. it looks pretty spectacular from a... Um, an aerial yeah, that's, photography that's right. That's on my head list. Nick. Talk to Tom Putt. He's done that. Yeah. yeah. And, so uh, the, 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 guy, the guys at Uluru, uh, the we, we take out, they do a they do a plane flight. They'll do doors off um, to take you over Amadeus as well. Yeah. Uh, the guy, the guys from Kings Canyon uh, or Kings Creek, in fact, they're, they're based at. Uh, mm -hmm. They fly out over Amadeus as well because they're closest. They actually take the helis over. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's definitely one worth doing. I've, yeah, again, it's on my it's on my bucket list as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, they, they, trying to get out there. Go and do it, and just never got around to doing it. So. Yeah, I, I have seen some wonderful aerial shots from like Amadeus. Mm, well, yeah. along the line that lines of abstract work that I love to do, but just to give you an idea, and I'll leave this on the screen very quickly. This is one that did not get approved um, because the whole of that northeast face is exposed, and that was a sunrise shot. Oh, wow! Well, uh, that was annoying. You're talking about Jay. Sorry, 
Are they kind of the dunes you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, so that's that's the kind of dune effect that you'd be wanting to you'd be wanting to look for because you've just, uh, that sun comes up, it lights up one side of the dune while everything else. Oh, what incredible leading lines down to Uluru. Wow. Yeah, and you, you, but you get all of that. So if if you can you work work with your pilot. If you go up with doors off, work with your pilot on, you know, give him some ideas of what you're looking for. Yeah. The pilots that do this daily, so they they know where to take you. Uh, this, when, it, it, can, it can vary um, in terms of the, sorry, interrupt. It can vary in terms of experience, and a lot of the time they think you want to be up closer closer to it. So yeah. sometimes it actually to get this, you actually have to tell them to fly quite a ways away from the rock, yeah. which isn't always um, and, intuitive to do. So. And that was the issue with this one was I kept saying to the pilot, "I can't photograph here. I can't photograph here. I can't use these photos," and he just wasn't getting it. Mm. So, uh, yeah. so whereas you know, I wanted me and my yeah. client to be around the other side to be able to photograph it, but the pilot just wouldn't take us there for some reason. So, um, so yeah, so you do have to uh, you have to have those long conversations with your pilot to make sure that they're taking you to the right spots as well. Looking um, at uh, yeah, looking at the um, uh, at Google again, uh, west of the sunset viewing area. If you're up there for sunset, it looks like there's some pretty cool dunes west of that area yeah. that could light up at sunset. Um, which would give you the same effect, but not include the um, the northeast face. I, I think it was it's 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 one of Pat Tang's shots, isn't it, Luke? Is that when you guys went up into that sunset? Yeah, I can show some shots of the. Oh, you've, you've got that as well. You can show yeah. some shots. I'll, yeah, I'll we'll... finish. I'll, I'll rain off here quick and get onto Luke. So, oh, that's all right. Uh, you can show some of his images as well because Luke's got exactly that with a leading line of dunes at sunset. Um, yeah, that I'm to see Luke's work. Pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's got a lot actually that haven't shown anyone before, so it should be interesting. Yeah, get it out. Sure. Process. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, give it some air, mate. It needs it. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is Field of Light. Uh, we were very lucky to be able to go down to Field of Light and actually walk down, and we set up our cameras very, very close to the edge because one of the staff said, "Go and set up over there. That's where you can go and set up over there." The next year we went back with another staff member come and said, you can't set up there. Mm. Um, and so, you know, very different experience, but very lucky with this one here. All the shakes in the middle of the uh, field here. Mm. We're rising up through the middle. Yeah, we've uh, had conflicting reports. If you could take a tripod in there, which is obviously game over, if you want to try and handhold that, good luck. Yeah, and right. so, um, and you know, they, they, some people say you can't take them in at all, and then they'll be like, no, you can take from the track. So if you're going to go, just take one, and if you don't use it or you get told off, then don't use it, obviously. But it's it seems yeah. so variable. It's more just from a crowd tripping yeah. over thing. It's no no other issue other than yeah. just a... And just Anthony take, was and saying not tripod's not allowed, monopods are. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's the point of a monopod? 30 second monopod. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Good luck. Well, you'll be right with a Canon R5 pod. Well, I'd, I'd give it a crack. Hold eight seconds I'd, or something. I'd give it a crack, Nick. I would. If, if, you, if, you're setting, if you're setting up on the very edge uh, on the track on the side, you'd, you'd be okay with the tripod. It's just actually when you're walking on the track on the inside, it's very, very dark. Mm. So setting up a tripod in the middle of the track when you've got like 40, 50 other people from your yeah, bus generally... walking around you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, a, it's a public thing. liability waiting yeah. to happen. Yeah. Um, now might be a good time just to to just to clarify about the astrophotography at Uluru and Kat uh, Junior. And is it um, you can't in, so apart from your workshops, which would obviously be the ideal way of doing this, um, you're not allowed in the in the um, national park at night. Yeah. So. Is there any restriction on astrophotography as long as you're not doing the northeast face or, or, or other sensitive spots? Is there any yeah. restriction on doing it outside of the national park and maybe using a, a longer focal length to get a similar effect? So from from on the dunes just outside of town, you can you can get some shots out to Uluru in that direction. Yep, and there's no restriction of that at night. It's just simply that you can't be inside the national inside park. The there's, there's one real um, big problem though, and that's that you won't get an alignment like that. Won't get an alignment. Um, right so right. where where um, Yulara yeah. Village is versus the um, the Uluru itself, um, yeah, it's not going to line up like that. So the the absolute sort of almost miraculous, I suppose, but the the um, the sunset. I guess it's not surprising, but the sunset viewing area faces east, and so it's perfect for an eastern rise of Milky Way, and exactly the same at Cutter Judah. So it's sort of um, yeah. pretty pretty unbelievable that the how how well it actually works that way. So, so it makes um, sense. I can see that you wouldn't get there any other way. Yeah, right. Mm. Okay. 
So, I mean, if you, so if book you, a workshop with you guys. <laughs> the, 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 if, if you wanted to do that yourself, the best dates to be there is going to be uh, mid-July. Mm. Because yeah. mid-July, the Milky Way is already rising. You know, you're getting closer to um, back into winter as well. So it's starting to get a little bit wiser. Um, but you've got the Milky Way's already risen above the rock just after sunset. So you've got an hour, 45 minutes to an hour before you actually have to depart the area. Ah, so gotcha. the last line, you can just about get, you can get the transition as well, blue sky. The transition's really dark. good too. I really Transition's great. I got, yeah, got a really good shot to get. Um, and, you know, so you can stay there for that. So, but obviously, yeah, the preference is that you're actually outside of the park by 7.30, that time of year when it closes. Now, I mean, so a lot of discussions about this one happened this year because uh, some people in the group were went into the park uh, the day that we left. And we were talking to them because friends who were on the workshop with us this year knew them uh, and been in discussion with them anyway. Um, I'd always been told that you they would never allow permits for um, professional photographers to go in at night. Uh, apparently that's now not the case. So if you are a professional photographer, uh, you do have an ABA and you've got appropriate public liability insurance and you have a reason to be capturing, uh, apply for a permit. And a reason life. as a, a commercial outcome as a commercial outcome yeah yeah so um and you can apply for a permit and, you know you the biologist they would they would approve that permit for you to go in not to operate at all not to operate commercially but to go in and capture uh you would have to go through a media briefing we have to do it every year when we go as well we have to re renew that briefing every year uh that goes through a lot of the things we've talked about tonight about the areas you can photograph the areas you can't uh and the, for the night side of things, you have to have certain preparations in place um, around making sure you're carrying walls to have alternate communications, things like that in place. But, you know, but they are approving permits if you're professional. Uh, you do need to make sure you get public liability, 20 million cover. You've got to make sure you are working as a photographer because they will go and check. And they do turn permits down for people who don't have the credentials uh, as, a, as a professional. We get checked pretty much every night we go out there. Um, someone will come and have a look and see. Yeah. Even if they know that we're in the park, they'll still check. They'll still come over and check. Yeah. 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 We're still wow. seeing rangers approaching us in the middle of the night asking us why, you know. Because people try to camp there and all sorts. So people try and get away with all sorts of um, staying in there. So can you camp um, anywhere near, well, where is it? It was camping as opposed to staying at a fancy resort. Uh, actually, at uh, the resort. So yeah, just the the resort. Resort. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. And the, there's only the one campground there now as well. So, um, uh, uh, which is always busy, <laughs> um, especially in the, the you know the six months before the climb closed, the campground was fully booked every night for six months. Oh, I can imagine. Um, yeah, because yeah, so many people come in to to do it before it so before it closed off. So yeah, so crazy. Uh, give you a few other shots as well. This is again out at Minuji, the wall hole that's on that track that comes down from the little car park towards the water hole first thing in the morning. Beautiful dead tree right in the middle there with the Milky Way rising over the top. Always a great shot to be able to go and get first thing in the morning there. And again, sometimes you can go and find yourself a nice composition with the moon rising mm. uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, and get, get one of those moon shots with that uh, you know, dark moon landscape. Um, coming across in front of you. Uh, there's something about full moon and desert landscape. It just, just, just sends me a rubbery one. It's a uh, uh, very spooky environment to be in, but yeah. put your eyes adjust to it. It's just it's such a beautiful place to be. Mm. It's great <laughs> being able to operate like that without needing a head torch or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and I'll probably, I'll, I'll kind of conclude off here. So again, so we went out this year and the fantastic thing was the Sturt Desert Peas were out uh, after all the rain that they've had because uh, they've had so much rain. These flowers are just beautiful. Ooh. Absolutely stunning. It's not a great photo. I've not processed it, but it was just, yeah, just amazing to see just clumps of them everywhere you were looking. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to see them out there. Uh, a lot of other wildflowers are out while we were out there as well. So, uh, again, pretty mm, impressive. Mulla -mulla, I think. That one. Yeah, Mulla -mulla, yeah. Um, so a lot of other wildflowers are out there as well. So again, it's that, it's that time of year. If you know there's been a lot of rain um, and you head out uh, beginning of winter, you know you're going to get a lot of wildflowers out um, around Illa and around the National Park. So, so again, worth picking your seasons uh, and thinking about the conditions that have passed in the months beforehand uh, before you actually plan to go there. Cool. 
Well, uh, give you guys an idea. This is the crew we had group from shot. a few years ago. Group shop in front of Uluru for Milky Way Rising. Very hard to organise everybody again. Stand still for 15 seconds. <laughs> is that you there, Luke? Burning cats. Um, yeah, it's Luke there. Right, yeah. Yeah. Gee, you're looking, looking a bit uh, thinner there, mate. <laughs> Yeah, you know, ebbs and flows, as they say. This was a pop in the kettle black. 2020, <laughs> didn't, right didn't, um, lens. 2020 didn't treat me very well. That would have been before then. So, no, it's my excuse, yeah. mate. <laughs> uh, this is what it looks like after you've got off the helicopter. And uh, and this is the group that just came with us as well. I don't know if they've seen this or if they're online. Ah, they're cool. Going off for the helicopter. Super cool. Uh, oh, wow, they got harnesses on. So, yeah, yeah so the Jess has is there. She was very keen yeah. to be harnessed up on the side with her legs dangling at the edge. I don't know well, if can't see why. Yeah, the, <laughs> in terms of um, aerial flights, Paul, you, you, yeah, a lot of froth for you there, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's that's froth material. Get you around and poke your legs out and yeah. get right into it. You know me, Lucky. I don't know if she had the particularly best experience doing that um, in terms of no, the airflow too, and too, things. Too, but, too much, too yeah. much buffeting around with with yeah. the heavy lens on. So, mm. um, so yeah, so a little, little tricky to get the shots in. So, but I think it, yeah. with, with the look on their face, when they they came, boys, yeah. uh, five. <laughs> uh, and just the last thing, if you go to Uluru, you must do a uh, uh, walking away with a fedora on. Shot. Oh, <laughs> fedoras! Huh? I used to be the fedora king. Who's your Indian blanket? Jesus. Yeah, well, uh, when we got into the airport, there was um a few ladies with fedoras and white white um dresses fedoras and white, things, white so you can skirts. see ah. that they were going to straight to Little Julie Waterhole probably for the yeah. shot. So and they were and they were they were from Brazil, so they were all oh, right. There. So yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they 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 flew out with fedoras and white skirts. And, yeah, we're sort of walking around a couple of days later, still with fedoras and white skirts on. So it was, uh, you know, you must do that. Even the boys, the boys should go out and wear fedoras and white skirts and do the walking away shot. <laughs> yeah, if, 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 if Katarina is online, that that's that photo. I didn't send it to you. I don't think so. I might send it to you anyway. Here you go. <laughs> Luke, do you want to show some shots? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, um, yeah, I'll see some Lucky's pictures. I'll put some stuff across. Um, just bear with me one sec. Um, yeah, well, I think it should be this screen here. All right. So, um, just the, now when you fly into Uluru, it's always a good idea to try and, um, be on the left side of the plane. I believe it is well, it's certainly indicating that picture, um, because you will get a, um, potential view of Uluru and then, uh, Katajita actually lining up behind as well. I don't know if that's the allowable side of Uluru, but and you may actually get an image like that approved um, because it is so far away. It's hard to actually identify the cultural sites, but um, but that's um, up to the discretion of Parks Media. But that's, um, yeah, so that's just a bit of a, a setting shot. Now, my first experience at Uluru was actually um, doing a job for Tourism NT, and um, we had the unfortunate situation of... Um, being there in August, which is actually not a good month to go for Eastern Rise Milky Way Corps. Basically, this is at the transition between day and night. Um, you have a beautiful purple hue that happens at that time. It's one of my favourite times. And um, I guess the time we normally the shoot, it's about 7.30. Um, just, it's pretty much just near park close, actually. Um, and um, in this instance, the, the Galactic Core was um, probably too high for what I would like um, in terms of the composition. So I actually had to do a, a Vertorama. Uh, you know, stitch pano to, to actually fit it in to make it actually work with the overall image. And it's been quite a successful image, this one, actually. It was at one point on the um, side of the French uh, Australian Embassy in, in Paris um, on, on the Tourism oh, Australia awesome. billboard. Yeah, and so um, yeah, it's 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 definitely got a bit of attention from that, which is also good. Once licensed it to Facebook, believe it or not, so that was interesting. Um, but um, yeah, the um, and you know, obviously it was approved and all of that. Um, so yeah, so that's a that's a really really. I mean, that's the classic um, sunset viewing area, looking straight across, and it's just more about timing. But I do advocate strongly about the 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 transition time because you get a nice exposure on the foreground and the sky at the same time i don't do a composite um with these sort of things and during that trip we also got um cut judah and of course cut judah was also um you know in my mind too it was too far uh, out to make it work although i tried to by going quite wide here 
Um, we also got a little bit of um, zodiacal light. It might be hard to see. It's easier to see in the thumbnail um, a beam of light coming up here. But um, you can see if you're not if you don't have the galactic core there, it's just basically a field of stars, which is nice, but it's not really what you're after. Um, here's just a couple are about the actual trees themselves and the, the trees are actually so, i absolutely adore the the um desert she oak trees um they're just um especially like with this sort of backlit silhouette sort of look i don't even think that really i don't think that one is even um dead necessarily it's just um just the way it shows up um uh, in that sort of early morning light and this is um not the best shot i've got of it but this is my favorite she oak there sort of um composed with um with um all the way behind. Um, here's a this is just another more reference shot for Motojulu um, waterhole and the and the um, kind of weathered ridges that that come down um, from the from Uluru. Right. Um, and um, oh, this is the other. This is my more favourite shot of that she oak with um, must I think it was quite a long exposure, um, 388 seconds um, just to get a bit of star movement as well. So. You're sort of facing what west there so you're not going to really get um uh, any sort of star trail as such but um you can sort of see the it arcing that way and then arcing this way um uh, so there's no polar alignment from that perspective well done with the separation there luke you're very good at that. Oh, i had to work hard for that mate yep. um it's it's a game of millimeters and, yep. and if you've got a, a tripod or a ball that, head, that, is it doesn't, that doesn't um that doesn't work for you um I, I actually have cropped this one square for instagram because it was quite a long time when pretty much i just shot all my stuff for instagram um but um i think the wider shot would look well although i can see some leaves coming in the side here so maybe it, that crop works best for it um that's another take on it as well um from there this one was an interesting opportunistic one from one of the flights i did i think it's actually like a a, looks like a burnt tree that's fallen over i don't quite yeah. know if that's what's actually happened there but um wow. a lot more to shoot than just the actual um icons i suppose when you're up in the air and you can get some beautiful light on the the spin effects and seeing all the rings in the spin effects and the shadows being cast by the trees and yeah, and the impacts of the fire it, it really gives you quite a lot to go with um and yeah, this is probably my favorite aerial shot um, or that I've processed and released, but this is, this actually shows you the sunset viewing area in the foreground here. Um, and so when we're taking our photos, we're actually right at this point here, um, just at the end of the sunset viewing area, probably giving the secret away there. But there are, it's quite surprisingly, most people will just pile up all along here. And then by the time you get to the end, because you drive in this way, there's hardly any, well, less people at the end, which is actually the best spot to take pictures. So that's quite fortunate that that human behavior tends to do that i believe that area there used to be the old campground there you can see the clearing there yeah, but yeah this is a, a sunrise shot so you're getting the sun coming in from from this side and and you know it's you sort of had to do a little bit of work to make the shadowing not so prevalent um and you know the the flaring can be a problem so i, I do find it more challenging to to shoot at that time um, and then I, I sold this a few times too, just a, a, a quick shot with um, Ulara Village in the foreground. And again, because I mean, it's not the correct side of Uluru there, but because it's so far in the distance, um, that, that um, reduces any of the problems. Um, so you can still have that work for you commercially. Uh, just another couple of quick ones here of some astro now i really like this one this is taken in the camel dunes and, and just more playing with the wildflowers that were out and i hadn't really seen these wildflowers since um but um yeah just it's nice to be able to play with different perspectives and you know your subject, subject doesn't always have to be in 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 focus in the back um so i like when it's out of focus in the stars they they become quite a bit bigger um as well although the foreground subject's not that particularly interesting no that's a great um, shot luke i love oh, it geez, this is um this is one of my faves as well. This is um this is not doctored at all. Um, so this is actually the zodiacal light coming up as a, a beam, and I've never seen it so straight, and I've never seen it this like this since. Um, it's just a very special evening, especially the different tonalities that you can kind of get around. You can see a very small cut of Judah there in the distance, and I'm sitting up here on on the top of a camel dune. And I always tell the story with this that 
to get this shot, I had to have the camera on the ground, obviously, because I'm pointing up and it's a very low perspective and I needed the separation of me um, above the horizon here. And so, you know, I was spending all evening sort of lying on my belly, just getting it all ready. And then um, the next day I realised that it was a camel dune and, and at sunrise saw it was actually all full of camel dung. So um, I'd been rolling around in that all night. So that was quite, that was quite fun. <laughs> um, but um, that's what happens. Yeah, so it's just a couple more um, with the zodiacal light, which is pretty cool. Here's some of Karajuda, so um, some different perspectives there. Um, definitely a, a magical place for, for photography. Um, and um, this is this is what, what happens when you get like a car coming past. It sort of illuminates the car, side. Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's just, um, I, I don't think I'd use it any, for anything in particular. It's just quite interesting that, um, you know, it's, it makes it a bit more unique than I guess than most of the other yeah. shots. Although the, having the Milky Way there, like that's probably um, going to do that too. Um, so, yeah, and then it's good, good fun for star trails as well. Um, can create some really interesting effects and and this is all sequences from a, a time lapse so you can imagine having that as a time lapse as well would be quite good the it's annoying thing about layering. time lapses really? yeah it's the annoying thing about time lapses is that um because you do have all of the car traffic around and there's people coming in the in the in the the you know driving in behind you and illuminating the foreground so much yeah. um it, it the, there's a lot of it's very distracting from the actual um galactic core itself so yeah. um so that that's but, but you know the time lapses are very still very stunning this isn't one to, this is a really good one highlighting the sapling um that's that's since burnt um which yeah, it wasn't a very popular little plant um, what are, does some did, photographer go out and burn? <laughs> um, no they did a controlled burn in the in the foreground i believe in it and it well, who knows though someone might have um taken their revenge but um it's a bit of a shame really it's um doesn't deserve that uh, but this is um the foregrounds here is actually lit by a a car that's coming in uh, from behind us and so that's actually enabled the all, all of the um sometimes it's actually quite fortuitous having that car come in and it, it can wash out the foreground but if there's a certain amount of light and i guess you're taking many many frames as you're here um you'll end up getting one that actually kind of works um yeah i guess i could probably clone out some of those elements but um you know that's Kind of not how I go. Um, this one here of um, Kata Judah has always been pretty pretty nice. The, the amount of um, glow that you have on the on the domes here is just um, you know it's almost um, you know popping the saturation. It um, it's it's really quite like it. It really shows through. That's like a darker process of it. Um, but it, yeah, it really shows um, through, especially on a long exposure. After, uh, and, and that, that would be 350 seconds. So it's, yeah, it's quite a long exposure there to, to really uh, amplify all oh. of that light. Um, I actually had, did take an infrared camera to uh, Ulla at one point. And so this is actually that um, tree that um, Jay was showing. But, but yeah, with, you um, haven't seen a shot like that, Logie. Yeah. And it, but the thing with this is that. Um, there must have been just a little bit of light coming through. So I haven't actually really worked on that too much. So we've got to get that one done. Like a 12 um, or something? Yeah, I think that was um, 16 millimetres, that one. Yeah. yeah so. I would be putting some time into that. Well, that's, that's, that's from 2017, that, is, that image. So. <laughs> absolutely um, stunning, Luke. Right? Yeah, You're so, reminding me why I like your photography, Luke. I've, oh, I, well, I had good. forgotten, but you, you, you're slowly pulling me back in. Oh, that, <laughs> that, that is a <laughs> freaking keeper, Luke. A bit like. of a worry yeah. that um, you forgot, Nick. I, I need to. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm need just to, on you tonight, need Luke. need to better. choose my friends better, I think. That's, um, <laughs> that's, that's become clear. Um, these aren't meant to be These aren't meant to be coming up. I'm just changing some folders. Um, these are obviously the initial shots that I've taken. Um, and I, I'm just exploring a folder at the moment, um, finding stuff I haven't looked at since I was in Uluru. Um, this is um, yeah, this is uh, the Murujulu location. Um, there's a few here of some of the wildflowers that were around at the time. Just a really beautiful um you know, uh, all sorts of different shapes and then was playing uh, with those in front of Carter Judah as well. Um, just trying a whole bunch of different things. Um, it, it was it was quite amazing, wasn't it? That for, you know, for the probably the first time ever that we've been out at Uluru uh, for our Astro tours, we spent sunsets more focused on wildflowers than we did on the Yeah, rock. it was, it was, um, it was really a pleasant change. I'm sure for the, for our, um, 
our participants, they were kind of like, what's going on here? But, um, you know, it's always nice to have some storytelling images as well that also reflect what's going yeah, on no, um, as well. So, yeah, so, I've just, you know, I've got plenty to go through here yet. How, um, how many to, nights are the workshops? Uh, how many what, sorry? The three nights of the workshops? Um, the workshops are, yeah, three, four, three, uh, yeah, three nights of that you, we kind of go out and shoot, though, but um, sometimes four. Um, depending on um, what happens with the weather, I suppose. But yes, um, let's see some of those more detailed ones. It's probably not a legal shot, actually, that one. Yeah, so I went back to the same um, same uh, flowers in the morning and tried with a sun star, which, which, um, which is pretty oh, yes. cool. Um, what else have I got here? Um, Looks like, oh, I don't know what that's about. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, oh, that's yeah. good. Hey, hey, it's, it's, really... it's, it's really good because I've lost 15 kilos since then. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and this is all, um, I really love this sort of curve in the tree. It's quite um, yeah. provocative. So, and just really shows, I mean, this is completely unedited, um, like in nothing, nothing touched at all. The um, just the the color and the how vibrant um it actually is and then it sort of backs off a bit after after dusk and you kind of get uh, well after the sun sets and you, you're starting to get a few stars coming through now um and you know, how do you, how do you set that up like you basically got it on the ground on a it's the tripod uh, it was a, a very game of millimeters again just um trying to put the tripod in the right sort of place it's a bit dark that one but you can kind of see um the galactic core above um Cantu gorge there um so that that'll be quite nice uh, and then it, this is a bit of zodiacal light here um with those those beautiful trees oh, also so, yeah, yeah. from the other side of um from the other side of um uh what is it um Murujulu. so that's a bit of a, a lame selfie there actually but um <coughs> this is another spot i really like actually um under under the mulgas um just um, at the sunset viewing area as well, oh, it sort of creates yeah. something. It's really hard to find foregrounds, and and you know tend to get a lot of stuff that is basically, um, you know, um, just you know straight into the spin effect. So it's nice to find a few little features like that that can actually um, work for you. And I'll finish off with um, the um, some aerial footage um, of uh, the shoot that I did, which is um, pretty spectacular. Um, so um, this is uh, Kata Judah from the air. And so what's pretty remarkable about it is that we've actually got three layers here. We've got uh, Kata Judah, uh, you've got Uluru, and then just in the very distance here, we've actually got Mount Connor, which is also known as Fuluru, um, which is oh, um, yeah. another, another oh. monolith out there. And for those that are driving into Uluru, there's actually this um, yeah, sort of almost like a mesa um, we were talking about with Matt the other day, which is yet to come up. Um, but um, yeah, it's a really interesting feature. But to have them all lined up like that is, is, is really, really cool. So, mm. and then as, it, as the sun was setting more, you know, so the colors start to change a little bit. Um, it was very hard. like I had to kind of focus on this shot because um, you want to have the five domes in it and then you also you mm. ideally don't want to have any of these in it either so it still might not be approved for having these in here um, so so it is very tricky and then you know there's a few you know you still take the, your personal shots as as um as um you know um we, you're sitting there with a camera so you want to do something yeah so this oh, is wow. um oh, this is kind of like that. the the major sort of view here um where you've got all of the dunes in the foreground and what i really adore is the shadow of Uluru yeah. coming from behind is that is that an angle you could use commercially Lucky, or not? yeah that's that's fine i believe because that's oh, wow. the that's uh that's actually the sunset viewing area there and that's the where the, gotcha. the climb used to be Oh, um, and that's Cantu that. Gorge in there. So, so there's a few like um, a few different angles and things I need to play up with that to 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 make it work. But um, Ooh, yeah, amazing but, seeing Uluru's shadow stretching off into the distance. Yeah, there. it's really um, it's really kind of, uh, and it's special too because you're above at one point at um, the actual um, the, the yeah the dunes start to lose their shine but then the rock just keeps on going and that's really really awesome but i actually do think it's a bit nicer when the dunes are dunes are happening as well and and you really only get yeah. like a you know a small period of time when that happens um i think yeah, we're probably on our way back here 
yeah but you can see the really amazing like i still like this because of the you've got the real strong belt of venus behind it's, like it's a light bulb yeah then totally unedited too which is cool because it's like oh well, it got a bit bit of bit of opportunity there to, to this is actually the shooting situation just so you can see um there was the pilot here i think um uh there was gent there and then it was pat to my left and then i had to shoot over his lap because it was all out of the one on one side and if i shot out the other side i'll be shooting out of a um out of a perspex window basically so um yeah so we Tricky. did we, we went out quite a fair way from um from um the rock to to really kind of play up the, the oh, different wow. textures and dunes and yeah. um and that's looking out the other way too so there's a lot of kind of you know, vanishing out into nowhere kind of wow. stuff as well. Yeah. So, um, and then um, finish off with, um, it wouldn't be um, all over without finishing off with the Astro. And so this is, um, there's actually like, this wasn't even in the park. So you don't need to go into the park to do Astro. Obviously, if you want to have Uluru in it, that, that's advantageous. But um, there's some pretty amazing trees around um, the actual resort itself that you can sort of find and work on and and, um, and create your own sort of photos from as well. So, um, and this one actually is dead, unfortunately, but um, yeah, it's, it, they just have so much um, character to them, these trees. And so it's really nice to be able to um, find them and find it, find your subject, sort of drive around a bit during the day and try and find a tree that kind of works for you. And um, yeah, just hopefully the spin effects doesn't uh, bother you too much while you, while you're down there trying to get your shots. The great um, thing about the dead trees is they don't move around because there's barely ever any wind. So yeah, exposures with them and uh, not have moving foliage or branches around it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, so that will is it. So um, yeah, thanks for oh, such a treat, Lucky. Thank you. Mm. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I need to really enjoy that. Um, yeah, four or five years behind on those. Um, so <laughs> uh, just need to um. Yeah, it's like anything. Try and find time to. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. If I would say that that infrared one and in, in that gully there, I'd be spending some time on that one, Luke. Shady. Yeah, I've got um. Yeah, that was a, it. Was a challenging place for infrared, but um, it wasn't. It was definitely worth bringing the camera along. So if you're into that sort of thing, then um, yeah, well worth um experimenting um as well. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that brings us to the end of the show. Um, we have to thank Jay so much for joining us and providing us um, all of his amazing knowledge and um, so much detail. Um, I don't think you're going to get uh, a much better uh, presentation, I think, on Uluru and photography um, um, than, than what we've had tonight. So we really appreciate your time, Jay. And, um, you're welcome, guys. Th yeah. Thanks for having me back third time around. No, yeah, that's all right. I'm going to try and find another excuse to get you back next. So... Um, <laughs> So that, no, that's, that, don't worry about that. So no, it's, you're always welcome. So um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, is, as to um, whether we actually are running uh, Uluru Astro workshops into the future, um, it's still, um, it's very COVID based at the moment and to see how all that's going to pan out. So, and certainly in Jay's um, hands on, on that respect, because Jay is the, um, Jay's the, um, the guy with the, all the paperwork so um and i'm just I'm, I'm the sidekick so no very much appreciate that and um do you know i guess um next week we may be having a break and, and running a premiere of um an international guest so we've got a that's more than likely what's going to happen isn't it paul yeah i reckon yeah yeah, so we've, we've, um, we've got Matt Payne next week, um, who's the um, host of F-Stop Collaborate and Listen. Um, he joined us um, last week for a, um, a pre-recorded interview. Unfortunately, it's 3 a.m. for anyone from the U.S. if they want to come on live. And I don't know if we can, um, we, no, we're not, we don't pay our guests and we might have to start doing that if it's 3 a.m. <laughs> I reckon. Um, but um, yes. Yeah, it so a great show. Yeah, 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 it was really great. Um, it's fascinating. It's really interesting to hear about the um, Colorado Rockies um, and Matt's approach to photography and, and a few other things a, a around the community as well. And his so, love of the mountains. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's called The Call of the Mountains and that'll Call be um, premiering same time as usual on YouTube. Hey, but... he's, he's such an interesting <laughs> guy. We ended up almost carrying on for I don't know how long afterwards. Yeah, another probably so hour almost. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah no, it was really um yeah top bloke. So we we're, we're really looking forward to sharing that episode with everybody. So yeah, we're we're going to be snow hunting the next few days by the looks. That's yeah. true, actually. So um, big system coming yeah, through. Probably good time to have a bit of a break anyway from us being live. That is, um, but um, yeah, we'll, we've got plenty still lined up actually. So it's all all good that way. Um, so our premieres are really only just um for pre-records at the moment for international guests that that um can't be live or other guests that can't be live so just so you know all right well thanks so much Jay. yep thanks again thanks, guys. Appreciate um, it. awesome month we will catch you all next week